Hello, everyone. I am Liu Shitong from Tianjin University of Sports in China, and uh, the second author of this article. The
Dear colleagues, good afternoon. I'm very happy to see a great many participants. Many of uh, uh, you uh, will join us later. Let us start the work of our session. Our session has a wonderful title uh, with a very tough agenda. I have great many uh, talks here, uh, which are very interesting. And I would like to say that I am a representative of the medical service and I deal with athletes. I do understand how important this program is, how important this agenda is, especially when we speak about biological provision and uh, how important uh, it is to have the, uh, all the knowledge of specialists, I mean, um, and also we need results. We all work for the results and our sportsmen and our athletes need to be winning, first and foremost. This is going to be the impact uh, over the victory of our country at all the front lines, which at the moment we have. So we will need to work according to the agenda because we have quite tough agenda. We have great many, uh, great many um, We have a lot of uh, presentations today. I suppose that we can allocate 10 minutes per talk. If we have some presentations uh, extra, some uh, somebody who wants to speak extra, please um, just tell me about it. And before the break, I must apologize. The sound is not appropriate. Julia will be moderating. Vladimir will be monitoring the minutes and also the time frames. And I suppose that two minutes before the end of your presentation, we will notify that your time is almost up for you to have a chance to finish it, to finalize it in a nice mode. And then we will give each of our speakers a round of applause. So let's start working. Julia, can you uh, take the floor. So the first presentation will come from Makarenka. I must apologize, the sound is not appropriate for translation. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. So rehabilitation, uh, definitely uh, we saw uh, smaller numbers of patients as there was uh, fewer needs, fewer patients. Uh, we also saw a great number of uh, people, uh, I mean children who came to the outpatients clinics for rehabilitation programs this year. We have ongoing program of recuperation and rehabilitation, which was initiated last year 
by the government of the Russian Federation for the first time. Mm -hmm. This is the program which is aimed at uh, equipping and uh, training doctors in the area of uh, recuperation and rehabilitation medicine. St. Petersburg is also a part of this program quite actively, and we have quite good active equipment provision at the moment. And according to this order of the Russian Federation, we have a new centers which are going to be set up in the city. Uh, I would like to speak about the regional program of St. Petersburg and our uh, one of the representatives of the city government will be speaking a bit later about it. So to save time, I will just uh, give you a brief account of it. So the main aims and targets of this program are first of all, to have appropriate strategic planning in order to improve uh, living standards and quality of life of our patients, and definitely to reduce uh, disability rates. Medical rehabilitation is provided uh, in the primary medical and sanitary service, uh, and the high-tech service is also included. This slide shows you uh, e-reader system, which is used in patients in the early rehabilitation period. It can also be used in resuscitation and ICU, and even in patients with artificial ventilation. It is provided in three stages. I mean, medical rehabilitation it includes three stages when the patient comes over to the uh, hospital with MI or stroke, this is resuscitation. If he goes to ICU, then there is neurology or cardiology for uh, award for rehabilitation. This is the further stage. Further, the patient is routed either to the inpatient department or outpatient daycare centers with such rehabilitation programs. If the condition of a patient uh, allows us, we can move him on to the outpatient uh, center immediately. And also uh, some sort of spa and wellness resorts are uh, organized in the frameworks of the same program. Because it is comprehensive program, first of all, it is equipment or re-equipment of different settings, both at the first second or third stages. And the second part of this program is aimed at providing appropriate training and professional development for these uh, centers personnel, which is also included in the health ministry order. The aim of this program is to increase longevity among these patients up to the age of 78 on average. This is the aim which should be achieved by 2030. And also gradually we are appro approximating this parameter. Our main parameters, our main tasks are first of all to approve documents and normative um, and regulatory documents, excuse me, uh, in order to provide such service for the population of St. Petersburg according to these uh, regulations. These are the regulations which I quoted. And also one of the other tasks and aims is to equip and to develop the infrastructure of such medical centers and medical rehabilitation uh, stations for these patients to have full-fledged opportunity to resort to such assistance. And uh, definitely this federal budget should be allocated to the to different subjects of the Russian Federation, different areas, as we're a vast country, I mean, Russian Federation, such uh, cities, regions, subjects of Russia, of course, um, um, so there are some remote areas and then the patients will be routed to the adjacent or neighboring uh, centers in the neighboring regions, I mean. So these are the figures which we can quote for now. You can see that this these are the figures for the previous year. This is the number of settings which were equipped or re-equipped in St. Petersburg. In 2022, there were five. And this is the money allocated for the project. Taking into account that the program was initiated in um, summer 2022, we had to work in very stringent uh, timeframes. But nonetheless, I can say that all the settings which we mm, claimed 
were uh, equipped with all the necessary equipment units in St. Petersburg, not only in St. Petersburg, but in this city first and foremost, we plan to start uh, one integral register, which will allow the patient to be routed, uh, starting from the very first stage and ending up with a third stage of recuperation. And of course, we have statistical database, and uh, it will also facilitate the routing, and all the patient's cards will be in electronic format, which will allow all the um, doctors and ancillary services to have appropriate access to the medical data. Also, rehabilitation in for the inpatients uh, departments. This is one of our directions, directions of this program. Last year in St. Petersburg, there was a separate budget allocated, and it was also approved by the Ministry of Health. And the money was allocated to improve the standards for inpatients and outpatients department. It also tells us about the fact that patients can come over to the local clinics even and can receive this outpatient service uh, in, just in the local clinics next to their places of residence. I should say that this year we also initiated the program of rehabilitation at patients' beds at home. At the moment, we are just working on this project, and uh, we don't. Uh, we are just um, outlining this uh, the parameters of this program. Even the equipment we are planning, the equipment that will be uh, provided to the patient uh, to be used at home by their family members uh, that can assist their patients, and then this equipment will be taken back after the uh, recuperation period is over. Uh, routing is something I already talked about now. As in the program, this interdisciplinary team includes several medical fields, which at the moment are not even approved by the health ministry. And uh, nonetheless, we need to take them into account. This is uh, such... Uh, fields as doctor of medical rehabilitation and then also the uh, specialist or nurse uh, dealing with the medical um, rehabilitation. This is something that is not within the register uh, or list of medical uh, fields. And also, we need this document to be approved, of course, because we need uh, the settings to be working under one, uh, in, uh, one single unified list of medical uh, specialities. And also uh, nurses, instructors, they all must have appropriate, we must have appropriate system in place. I'm sorry, I, I've lost my slide. Also, we need to introduce uh, telemedical technology, which is another direction uh, under vast development. These are settings which are planned to be re-equipped in 2024. This is routing and one of the examples that I can uh, quote is um, Sistrarysk. It's uh, one of the satellite towns of St. Petersburg. This is the first rehabilitation center which was uh, set up in 1946. You can see this old building. And you can see how it got re-equipped, different sort of um, uh, hydrotherapy, how it used to look like and how it looks like today. You can see different robotic technology, which is used in stimulation. Uh, this is a rail system, different passive and active uh, mechanic therapy uh, equipment, how it used to be and how it looks like nowadays. You can see verticalizer, and also this is locomotion. We use it in four settings at the moment. This is how it used to be. And we're coming back to many of these um, methods, by the way, because they're quite, uh, quite, quite good. And so new, uh, of course, new technology is added to all that, but nonetheless, uh, we have accumulated quite good experience. Even in the Soviet time, uh, many things were already successfully used. I suppose that a comprehensive medical rehabilitation really facilitates uh, the 
uh, bringing up the person to normal life and uh, appropriate, with appropriate quality. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is uh, Yuri Auction. She will speak about, on, on behalf of uh, City Hospital number 100. Well, I should say that the uh, uh, World War II is uh, nowadays uh, rather um, far away. Uh, at the moment, we have more and more important documents, such as reminiscences of the, of those who took part in the war, like Bandera, for example, and Russia at the moment tries to protect the people abroad in Ukraine. And I suppose that this topic is really important for this uh, Congress, for the young generation in this country. There are many uh, disasters that happened in Sestraretsk in, uh, back in the years of the uh, Second World War. I should say that a lot of things were done by the heroes of that times and the Sestradiet Hospital also, doctors were also heroes. They were working in very tough conditions. In the Leningrad front line in 1941, there was taken a decision that the army of the Northern front line who were fighting in the Karelian strike settled in the alongside the Bay of Finland, along the Sistra River, and they started fighting with the, with the Finnish army, uh, an Asian army that uh, was trying to get to uh, Leningrad, St. Petersburg uh, of that time. You can see this map that shows that there were 200, 300 meters from the front line along the Primorsky Highway. It's almost the border of the city. This is the monument, how it looks like today. In September 1941, uh, the, and there was the fight and that the, and the, it resulted in a very um, in a very successful fortification which allowed us not to allow the enemy go further towards the city by the beginning of double uh, uw2 uh, the sisterless hospital included 190 beds and this is one of the doctors of pediatricians working with children and also there was an outpatient setting named after Malevsky. In the period of the war, you can see our hospital. Uh, it has already been demonstrated to you. It was back in 1946. In the first period of the war, when there were fights in the stripe of Karelia, all the wounded were sent over to Sestradiesky Hospital named after Alitsky. Within the first months, we provided service for 223 wounded soldiers. In July, there was another hospital organized for another 100 beds. Which after a short period, started also uh, admitting wounded soldiers. Then later on, they were uh, sent back to the front line. Several, um, several also uh, doctors who were affiliated to the uh, weapon factory in Sestralis, which was located in Sestralis as well. Um, most of them went to the front line later on. In the Sestravetsky uh, City Council, also nine, uh, oh, about more than 20 doctors were mobilized and sent to the front line. By September, the medical service was located three kilometers uh, away from the Razlif uh, railway station with 208 beds. 
the medical service included several doctors and 13 nurses who were working very hard in order to evacuate the wounded uh, soldiers and also to re-equip the new uh, premises and to provide medical service. I should say that over 1,000 soldiers were treated and provided a quality, a good quality service in this hospital. Also, we had outpatients department, which continued working in the wartime. In 1941-42, about 46,000 uh, patients were admitted there, and also there were even home visits. And the ambulance of Cestrarias also provided uh, more than 700 um, visits. This is the uh, Malevsky uh, local clinic, I mean the outpatients department. And these are the hospital interior. This is how it looked like in the uh, period of the Second World War. This is the ambulance car, evacuation of the wounded. It was pretty much the same in Sestradic. These are pediatric departments. When it comes to the pediatric department, I should say that the small children in Sestradic were not evacuated during the siege of Leningrad and they were provided with all necessary medical service. The pediatric consultation in September 1941 provided uh, over 400,000 home visits to pediatric patients and also there was milk uh, kitchen uh, for uh, little ones with uh, pro providing the uh, nutrition for small patients. There was also an orphanage for 60 beds opened up in the uh, period of the Second World War with the nurses and doctors providing all the necessary service for the small patients. And uh, there are reminiscences left about mm, um, by those who were uh, part of that orphanage. Uh, orphans came over from Gorska, from Tarkovka, from Razliv. All these are small villages around. Uh, children were really very weak. These were orphans, lost their families completely. They uh, were uh, dystrophic and uh, they uh, would have died if they were not admitted to the, those orphanages. Later on, some of them died and uh, they were uh, buried in Tarkovka. Uh, some, some of them survived because of that orphanage and uh, they were provided a great deal of mm, great deal of nutrition and uh, help. They were evacuated later on uh, over the Ladoska uh, Lake to Gorkov. Many people living in living in Cesarius nowadays uh, are grateful to those doctors because they managed to survive. These are These are doctors who uh, practiced in those times, and this is one of the plays. In the morning, 1942, uh, there was an attack of the Red Army, of the Russian Army, and this is one of the uh, pictures showing those events. And uh, I should say that uh, the work of doctors in those times allowed to bring back to the front line many soldiers and officers in the years of the Second World War. And I should say that that was one of the weapons of our victory. One of the weapons of our victory. And you can see the archive, the uh, photos of those times. We should say that we are still grateful to these people who worked in our hospital during the Second World War, approximating the May of 1945. Uh, this is contemporary city of Sestraritsk. And happy oncoming victory day to all of you. Now, let's continue with the rehabilitation um, agenda.
Now, I'm passing the microphone to Dr. Tiryoshin. He will speak about the events devoted to rehabilitation in the region and the regional program of St. Petersburg. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, for inviting me here. Please um, put up my slides. Okay, while my slides are being put up, I'd like to say that St. Petersburg is a traditional leader of rehabilitation, thanks to my, our hospital, by the way. Uh, we know that in 1974, when rehabilitation was just um, being born, this center uh, was the pioneer, and it uh, was the flagship hospital, uh, which provided the um, rehabilitation program, which was extrapolated for the uh, rest of the country. At the moment, it is being developed, and there is a huge impetus to its development. It is related to the fact that we have implemented a program which is uh, uh, titled as Optimal Medical Rehabilitation. According to this program, uh, it will uh, embrace three years, but we are not sure that it will continue after the three years. And this program, as a matter of fact, was planned initially uh, in order to, or in order for the medical rehabilitation to be well represented in the region. And St. Petersburg is traditionally the leader. There are many uh, patients who are referred to us from other regions like Nikolaev and other settings. So at the moment, the federal uh, plan is the following. You can see our targets. First of all, this is the improvement of the rehabilitation service as such, and also not only improvement of the equipment, but also uh, training for the personnel. You know that we have been uh, already working for a number of months according to a new decree and according to a new order of the health ministry. Definitely creation and improvement of the databases, uh, development of telemedicine and approximating the rehabilitation programs to the patient's beds. You know that on the 10th of April, we ratified the new order of uh, home health, provision, health service provision. This is a new trend in our healthcare ministry and we are currently implementing it. Then improving the patient's awareness, there is no great problem. With our patients are very well aware. We have also a routine, and it's also available uh, within three stages. The improvement of regulations, improvement of changes, and uh, just uh, introducing changes at all three stages, and also um, smoothing or sort of um, integrating these three stages. <clears throat> All these three stages are very well rooted. And at the moment, we're under discussion of how to improve efficacy at stage one and three. We're going to have a good discussion uh, very, uh, just in the nearest future in our health ministry. Last year, we started implementing the program. And by the end of the year, uh, we managed to re-equip more than 20 departments within five multiple clinics of the country, or of the city, sorry. You can see the funds, 200 million rubles from the uh, regional budget and 80 million from the federal budget. You can see the hospitals, which I mentioned. 196 units of medical equipment was recruited this is our flagman. This is our anchor, uh, hospital number 40, which actually, uh, this is Mariinska Hospital, Nikolaevska Hospital, Simashka in the town of Pushkin, and also a clinical hospital of St. Luke. This year, uh, the program continued its development. We have six different um, units, which also are part of this project. 
you can see that the funding is over 300. Uh, also, there is uh, 435 units of contemporary state-of-the-art medical equipment. We have many hospitals which are included in the project. Um, yesterday, we had a meeting with um, Anna Tsevilova, who is head of the foundation. And I should say that we are planning to enlarge our network in order to provide rehabilitation service for those who are fighting in Ukraine at the moment. This is city hospital number 20. And also there are two pediatric hospitals which are included, um, Raufasa and also a city pediatric hospital number 22 in Kopena. Staffing is very important and professional development for the personnel is utterly important. You can provide state-of-the-art equipment, but without good and well-trained, um, well-qualified and well-trained personnel, it will not be used appropriately. You can see the new specialists that we are training currently. For example, the physical rehabilitation medicine, last year we trained over 500 specialists. Although the work is still something that we need to continue, we uh, planned initially, we planned uh, an active period for the September or up to the September this year. But I should say that the, um, it will be ongoing. Uh, medical speech therapists are needed, by the way. So the health ministry uh, decided to prolong this um, education and professional development program. That's about all I wanted to tell you. I should say that the work is really big. We need to continue working. And I would like to say that I'm really grateful to all the specialists who are working currently with me within our project because we need your support. Thank you very much. Now, the next presentation will come from Sergei Sherbak. She will talk about the echo and the necessity to assess the left ventricle parameters. I will be the, the speaker, Olga Mamaeva. I am the co-author of this presentation. I also come from hospital number 40 from the Kurotne district of St. Petersburg. So we don't have any, uh, any disclosure. And um, we are currently creating a biobank. And starting from 2020, we can analyze these parameters in athletes as well as the uh, professional and non-professional athletes. We have also a good state-of-the-art equipment in our diagnostic department, which in fact I represent here. And I would like to say that the topic is really vast. Sometimes in the mass medium, we have tragic uh, tragedies in young athletes who uh, seem to be absolutely healthy and uh, wealthy and they are good personalities and nothing actually uh, would impede their uh, sports career, but some sort of uh, some sort of health parameters impact their destiny. And of course, we need to be looking for the predecessors of these particular conditions. Uh, for us, it is of great scientific interest and we really need to look into these uh, issues. At the moment, we work uh, in uh, this project uh, according to the presentations of the ESC, uh, which uh, clearly outlines who are the athletes, who are the elite athletes, and these are the terminology that we took into account. You can see the rate of sudden death among um, athletes. You can see that it is really uh, different from uh, the other populations. You can see that many patients, from 56 to 80%, uh, have problems with the sudden death or sudden heart attacks 
in patients also there are races and genders which are included in this as well as the types of sports like basketball football soccer these are the types of uh, sports which co correlates with the sudden death in athletes up to 56 percent of cases these are conditions such as hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy uh, coronary artery anomaly uh, um, or uh, abnormality uh, arrhythmogenic dysplasia uh, of right ventricle in three percent of cases myocarditis uh, also we see this enlarged um, in the uh, general population because of the COVID-19 when it comes to the etiology I'm not going to speak long about it but I would like to say that there is data, big data, which is uh, which derives uh, which is derived from large cohorts, and we have the understanding that what we see in ECG, which is a traditional tool for screening, does not match the data with echocardiography as well as the autopsy. Thus, I should say that uh, we uh, should take into account that it's really topical, really important to apply new state-of-the-art technology at the moment. Uh, ultrasound 3D is uh, quite possible, uh, taking into account all the parameters of the heart uh, structures. And uh, also you can use CT and MRI using our, using uh, echo SCG as well as the Holter's monitoring and ultrasound together, we can increase the probability of detecting unfavorable outcomes and um, cardiovascular events and even catastrophes in athletes. We have already conducted this study and in 2018 we already reported our results. We received high correlations of uh, 3D echo and MRI, which also uh, gave us another impetus to continue this study. The target of this study is to study the clinical and electrocardiographical uh, indicators in uh, patients of young age with remodeling of the uh, left ventricle. So that means that the presence of this remodeling was the basis of our further research, further study. We enrolled 92 athletes with the mean age of 21 age. In the comparison group, we had amateur athletes as well as we compared them with the uh, general population. At the moment, we don't have any regulations of the 3D echo uh, parameters and that's why we needed such additional analysis. At the moment, we uh, can give you a link to our published results to all the colleagues who are interested in this problem. When it comes to the physical exertion, you can see that we have uh, mainly uh, main, four main classifications. This is a high static, low dynamic, a high uh, mean static, mean dynamic, and the uh, High static, high dynamic. This is triathlon, um, water polo, biathlon, and um, and rowing. We understood that the types of remodeling, which are, were traditionally classified according to the echo ECG, in the fourth group with high static, high dynamic uh, exertion, you can see a heterogenic distribution of such remodeling, and uh, this is the understanding of the so-called athletic heart, such as hypertrophy of the left ventricle or concentric con type of hypertrophy. They would be present in this fourth group. In Holtis monitoring, you will see statistically significant difference in the heart uh, contractions in all periods of the day and night with a submaximal rate and of course, understanding the type of exertion, type of physical exercise, uh, we see these or that uh, peculiar features in different athletes, as well as the dilatation, I mean, enlarged cavity of the left ventricle, both in 2D and 3D, 
modes, as well as the impact over the heart uh, contractions. In the presence of remodeling, you can see lower heart rate. And also, you see that arrhythmia, such as extracellular high grade, which is related to the sudden death and heart attacks, uh, if there is a remodeling factor, they will be in the high they will occur in the high percent of cases. And also the atrial arrhythmia. I know that with age, uh, many athletes will result in the um, atrial fibrillation, which is very dangerous. And the predecessor, such as the uh, tachycardia, um, atrial tachycardia, uh, very frequently comes across, uh, comes um, together with the dilatation. This is a young patient, uh, aged 18, 18. Um, heart attack, he's a biathlon uh, athlete. You can see uh, ventricle tachycardia and we observed him dynamically, unfortunately within one year. The dynamics, according to our high-tech parameters, the dynamics was negative, was quite bad. And uh, according to the recommendations, and despite his uh, very high athletic status, he uh, decided to go into coaching. When it comes to the diagnosis, I should say there were electrophysiological, there were no cardiomyopathy, uh, myocarditis, was not detected clearly even on MRI. The analysis in our federal settings was conducted neatly, and the young man uh, at the moment lives quite healthy life, and uh, he is a coach. I should like to say that 3D echocardiography allows us to have significant um, volumetric information about the chambers of the heart. In young athletes, if uh, there is dilatation of the left ventricle in 2D or 3D modes, there will be also a low heart rate. And if there is 3D uh, mode dilatation, then we register also atrial tachycardia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now the next presenter will come from Alexander Vavaev, standardization of the uh, stage by stage control methods and the uh, testing the examining the athletes. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to give you an account of my presentation and I would like to speak about the problem of standardization. I'd like to say that the topic of this presentation is not purely medical, but mainly it's about organization of the medical service and the testing and examining our athletes, as well as following them up. So let me trace back the history. When it comes to the tests and examination standardization for athletes, we first started talking about that when the sports metrology appeared. And the first Publication was made back in 1979 by Zetsiorsky, who titled his book Basics of the Sports Metrology. And he spoke about standardization of methods, how to test them, and, how, and for the first time he spoke about standards. He also got them approved at an international congress uh, which uh, was which happened on the same day in Tokyo. But since then, we didn't witness many publications and books where specialists can get information about how to conduct such tests and examination in an appropriate way. I mean, uh, the meticulous, meticulous, uh, just description of tests. Some of them uh, would cover tests and examinations, but quite commonly, quite comprehensively, which allows us wide window for interpretation, which can result in various results. So here you uh, see uh, the books, and I would like to develop on one of them. This is an encyclopedia of uh, encyclopedia of testing, 
We just crash test quite nicely. And then, then in 2020, uh, there was a, a special book was published on testing, uh, on assessing of various sites of sportsman uh, training. But uh, this, you uh, within uh, this book, you uh, cannot actually fully understand how the test should be done properly. So it shows which tests are used to, to uh, with sportsmen. And uh, about the foreign publications, yeah, I would like to specifically mention this book, which was published by the group of authors from Australian uh, Institute of Sport, the second edition of 2013, which specifically stresses the importance of test standardization. It shows tests batteries for some specific sports, and it actually represents theoretical and methodical basics for sports, for athletes testing. Well, the topic of standardization is actually still relevant, and I'd like to start from the basics mentioned in the earlier uh, manual on sports methodology. But the main process, uh, standardization process A, is to reach comparability of uh, test results from different labs. It's very important, and at the moment in the Russian Federation, this goal is not uh, hasn't been reached. Even the leading uh, country laboratories, uh, different tests are done differently, thus producing different results. And the uh, secondary goals of standardization are improved to trust to uh, loading testing laboratory services is to uh, be an incentive for uh, sports scientists to exchange their data, to create a national database of sports laboratories using uh, similar standards, and also stimulation of national sports federation to use these databases, so they would refer their sportsmen only to those laboratories which use similar standards. Also, uh, it is important to develop database uh, with, uh, so to say, with uh, relevant uh, uh, deltas, relevant uh, error, uh, error rates, and also it's important to develop the uh, develop database of test results for high level sportsmen, so called normal uh, parameters. Uh, and especially to, uh, it is relevant for different ages, different sports. Uh, it has lots of, uh, it, it's very, it has uh, lots of interest uh, from, var uh, from all these uh, variabilities which are not yet standardized at all. And another issue of standardization is that from the point of view of development of the uh, sports, Till 2030, we have a goal. We have uh, we have an objective for uh, digitalization of sports, meaning development of uh, digital databases where we uh, sort of accumulate sportsman tested results, and they should be, of course, entered clearly understanding that they are comparable uh, to be used later on. Otherwise, these databases. Uh, such databases have no sense because if the test is done differently, you cannot compare them. Well, a couple of words about the standardization issues. Uh, it's actually a very relevant, a very uh, complex issue. So, actually, everything which might affect the results should be standardized. And there are huge amount of such. Uh, of such factors, uh, sports of behavior, uh, which uh, which kind of, uh, so to say, training they do, uh, how they do warm up, or there is no warm up before testing, which uh, uh, nutrition factors are used, uh, and the amount of carbohydrates, which will affect the amount of lactate, then the place uh, for a specific test in the testing battery, it's very important, it should be always the same. We should not change tests in the battery. We should change the test place in a battery. 
because it might affect the results. And those factors which uh, cannot be controlled or standardized, they should be clearly monitored or thoroughly monitored. Of course, the training per se, we cannot standardize it. Patients come for testing. When they come for the testing, the condition is you cannot change it. So everything of that should be controlled and recorded. Uh, so uh, to avoid uh, issues with uh, comparing different results, results in different time frames. And of course, uh, there are some other factors where are very important. So uh, use the equipment, uh, test uh, or data processing, and mass processing. And uh, just briefly, Embargo and Medas, can we compare their results? Of course not. They show different results. The same is about, it's a big, uh, big issue today. It's velargometers with electromagnetic loading. Can we compare Wingate test or MAM test between those two ergometers? There's the data, the results are not comparable. They produce different results. And uh, with the Monarch, we have a huge database. Uh, there are lots of publications, uh, model uh, parameters, and, so, and they're not uh, applicable to the uh, results produced by LADA or other magnetic algorithms. So in contact mats or tensometric platform or jump testing, we always should indicate which equipment we used was used for testing because Otherwise, uh, they produce different uh, jump height because they use different principles, physical principles on how to uh, then test the protocol. It's another, even more complicated issue. Couple of examples, Wingate test or bump test, but first of all, the Wingate test. For instance, in the internet, I can see such images. When we see, we see this person, the Wingate test, and is actually standing on the ergometer. So with classic Wingate test, you cannot do that. And all uh, guidelines, they say you cannot do that. But there are lots of questions which loading should be used. It's all variable. From place, uh, uh, from sort so of different positions, the jump test, uh, where, to, where the head should be used. Uh, you can sway with the hands or keep them under the waist. Uh, and of course, it affects how high uh, it's possible to jump. Another important issue is the test for anaerobic uh, thresholds. Uh, and there is such a variability that uh, it requires even special, uh, special conference for that. Then, how to calculate uh, this uh, uh, data. So uh, it depends on our averaging data. For instance, if data is not averaged, these peaks will we see uh, in elevated amounts, uh, not mentioning uh, anaerobic threshold. It will be the bloody fight, what is right, what is wrong, what is proper, which is not proper, but we have to come to some uh, grounds about that. Uh, uh, then variability of heart rate. Then, uh, then uh, in, uh, innovative uh, center of recording has several testing sites. It's very important, and it's uh, in all sites testing should be identical. Well. Today, you see, we have a template for uh, a, a template for test standard. It's really detailed, and, and non uh, no one still, even in the Australian Institute of Sport, has described that in such details. And we are at the final stage of describing those tests. And by the end of this year. We uh, plan to finish with standardization of those tests. Uh, we would like to uh, call everybody for collaboration so eventually we can test sportsmen using similar standards. Thank you.
and the next talk by Anna Domagilova, uh, Studies of Microcirculation as a Method for Medical Neurological Control in Sports. Good day. Uh, our topic was already mentioned. Well, in the context of the previous discussion, of course, we should say that uh, modern sports implies complex uh, control, and we pay today lots of uh, attention to medical biological control methods, which, along with uh, pedagogical and uh, psychological methods, is an important factor for to accompany the sportsman preparation. Well, the methods for medical biological control uh, today are, are quite hard to be interpreted today, based on the previous discussion. But we have, we are a per, per, per persistent search for the uh, interpretation, but what's important is what, but what is the requirement of such methods? They should be informative. Uh, they sh they uh, should provide a possibility for individual assessment. Of course, we should follow up uh, changes genetics. And, and of course, uh, this method should be simple uh, uh, with regard to processing, uh, data processing and interpretation. And we're trying to use these methods for to assess uh, circulation. Why we talk about microcirculation? Well, of course, it's one of the key systems which is used for uh, systemic uh, physical exertion. And adaptation changes can be seen on different levels of cardiovascular system. And today it was nicely shown already. So talking about the microcirculation, it's in final uh, stage. And here you see transcapillary exchange. And the whole activity of cardiovascular system actually is aimed for uh, normal microcirculation. At the level of peripheral uh, blood flow, we have different circulation uh, mechanisms which provide us with various adaptation uh, changes. Microcirculation was studied for many years, though it was, uh, there were some uh, mesonic issues uh, which uh, had to solve them. They were developed various uh, software and hardware complexes. Uh, they allow us to pull up uh, the results and to use computer processing systems. All of those systems they have the advantages. Disadvantages, I should say, is the sports ones, they use uh, all of them. But in our work, we use data produced with a modern uh, high frequency dopplerographer, Minimax Doppler K. The advantage is that we can visualize. Um, uh, blood circulation uh, uh, flow rate, and also uh, the parameters we use on the devices, they record uh, flow rate, we use uh, flow rate, and some several indices which describe the general muscular resistance. At the first stage, I should say, it has any technique, as any method, microcirculation studies imply uh, use of functional testing. Essentially, they mean a uh, recording of adaptation results, assessing multiple regulation mechanisms, and of course, based on that, the general uh, characterization of uh, microcirculation of functional status, which can be extrapolated to the general patient, uh, the general sportsman performance. We took several tests, which are the most informative for sportsmen, so in clinical settings, there are more of uh, tests, and they're more and they're quite successfully used when working with uh, different pathologies like uh, COPD or diabetes and others. We uh, we've chosen the vegetative and structural uh, test, occlusion test, and physical exertion testing. So the objectives of our studies was to uh, assess if we can use microcirculation testing methods when uh, testing sports. And today you already heard that at the level of the central components of cardiovascular system, we see adaptation changes. And it is uh, as mentioned in various uh, guidelines. 
Microcirculation was an issue for discussion for many years. Modern surveillance and classification, you see, is a different sport. They affect uh, microcirculation differently. We decided to see if there are any specifics uh, in, in the athletes. At the first stage, we studied 244 sportsmen, uh, 144 sportsmen with a control uh, arm of 23 sportsmen. We started systemic blood pressure, systolic and diastolic. So what about microcirculation? Well, at the period of control testing uh, in at rest, the lower blood uh, circulation we saw in the special sports uh, and mixed uh, sports. Uh, and for tests, we use uh, a grazing test which shows less of changes in virus sportsmen. And of course, there was a, a specifically, uh, we studied specifically a circulation restoration uh, compared it with the controls. Thus, we concluded all the lot of specific adaptation. And then I want to see if there is any specifics at the level of this separate Teslas, and we used the experience of uh, our colleagues who studied uh, sportsmen with a clear, uh, with a, uh, uh, with, a, with clear asymmetry. And here you see they, they studied, uh, they studied uh, fencers, uh, where the active hand showed clear response, versus uh, so to say non dominator not work. And uh, also wanted to take a look at the second stage. We started to look at uh, blood uh, flow rates. And uh, even there was one uh, training session in sportsman, we can saw some specific changes depending on the individual state, for instance, on the pulsation index or peripheral. Blood resistance one of the sports where we saw increase of those parameters. The optimal is considered to be decreased uh, peripheral uh, blood uh, peripheral resistance. In several days, testing uh, showed uh, such typical uh, changes in the sportsman, which shows us sensitivity of this method for operational control. And finally, I would like to say that we want to see if there is any connection of microcirculation with individual performance of a particular person in a specific period of life. So we use the standard method, which is nicely translated by our colleagues. So it was a, a stress respiration question, which is considered to be a very, uh, very convenient method to assess sportsman performance in the last days. We use uh, sportsman assets of, from acrobatic rock and roll, and we see the changes of microcirculation in the context of the test, there was a breathing test. It correlates with uh, parameters of general stress and tiredness. The individual performance of sportsman is specific, uh, in specific timing, and he's a sportsman individual or a individual uh, performance. So the worse is general status, the worse would be uh, as a result of the functional test. And at the end of my uh, talk, I would like to say that our data indicated that microcirculation studies uh, reflect long term and, uh, so to say, uh, short term adaptation of um, uh, blood supply. Of course, there are lots of issues to be discussed, but we can say uh, that this method registers specific, very specific uh, data. And of course, it should be standardized. We should consider sports specific, uh, sports specific uh, asset specifics. We will look at it. And we hope that well, finally we will develop uh, an algorithm how to apply this method for uh, current uh, response test. Okay. And the next speaker is Tatiana Rybiakova.
peculiarities of gender composition of the leading uh, swimmer uh, teams at uh, Olympic Games. Good day, dear colleagues. Well, swimming has an important role as a house improving uh, sports in many countries as well. It is a, uh, it considers a priority. According to the Ministry of Sports data, I'm sorry for that. After the Ministry of Sports data in 2021, so in Russia, is considered as one of the most popular sports, which involves more than two million four hundred thousand uh, people. Uh, Russia has a uh, grow, shows growing number of people uh, doing the sport, and we have more women. Uh, according to the studies, uh, women involved uh, practicing swimming, there are less of them than men, it, uh, and they are uh, uh, fractions about 40 to 45 percent. It is assumed that gender, uh, gender differences with swimming, they affect sports swimming and uh, representation rate of men and women in national uh, Olympic teams. The purpose of the study was to analyze gender composition of the leading Olympic, uh, gender composition of, of Olympic teams and compare medals as a uh, but also compare a number amount of world records uh, reached by men and women during the last 12 years. Methods of uh, test, it's analysis of uh, scientific publications, and analysis of statistical data, in particular gender composition uh, and, uh, and so, so uh, uh, and medal standings. You see a gender composition of the strongest uh, uh, Olympic Games swimmers from 1996 to, uh, till 2020. These are teams by Australia, States, China, Italy, uh, UK, and Russia. And you can see that in such countries like the uh, USA and Australia, a number of uh, men and women in Olympic uh, teams of singers was almost similar. And in Australia, team, we have even more women than men. Because in Chinese uh, team, this difference is quite comparable. It is uh, related to the, so to say, fast development of women swimming as a sport in China. Here you see the graph of medals, um, compared to men and women, by the American team. Uh, from 1996 to 2020. Number of medals in men since 1996, it, it, it grew till 2016, and then, then it was stable. Successful performance of the male uh, team for four years, uh, for, for years is related to the name of the, uh, to the one of the leading uh, swimmers, uh, leading world swimmers, uh, Michael Phelps. In women, in 2004, there was some drop, but the number of gold medals uh, grew. And in 2020, uh, women got even more gold medals than men. It is related to the names of uh, Amelia King, Katie Ledecker, uh, and others who won up to two gold medals uh, for the team. Here, you can see medals, which was uh, taken by Australia team. While, uh, while in 2004, uh, men were the leaders in the team, that still started from 2008, uh, women uh, was uh, returned to the leaders. Uh, in Tokyo, M. Michael was the leader, getting seven medals, and she got 11 medals, actually. Also, Kate Campbell and Ariadne Titus were quite successful. 
a successful performance of a seven swimmers in, in the year 2000 could be explained with the fact that the very well known Russian uh, trainer of uh, coach of Russia, Gennady Turetsky, worked with the seven. He, he worked with uh, Jan Torp, Mark Thiel, and Alexander Popko, a uh, and who actually uh, did the training in Australia. Another interesting fact in Australia, swimming is not only the, one of the most popular swimming sports, but also the number of women involved in swimming is uh, exceeds uh, uh, men. We can see this data uh, in one of the uh, publications. In the Russian team, we have more of men who brought most of the gold medals at the Olympic Games. Among them, we see uh, two double uh, double uh, Olympic champion, uh, in the Kratov and uh, and say Popov. There's a spirit only one woman uh, got gold medal. What is say ill? She came 28 at the distance of uh, 10 kilometers. The greatest contribution among women uh, was provided uh, by Yuna Yefibova, uh, who practiced uh, breaststroke. Another interesting fact is the ratio of uh, world records compared to men and women during the last 12 years. In 2009, uh, uh, there was, it was prohibited to use, uh, it was prohibited to use, uh, so to say, uh, swimming suits, which decreased water resistance with a minimal amount of uh, uh, will be allowed to of world records, but then it is case in 2012, 45, there were 45 uh, records by men and 16 by women, but then number of uh, world records by men actually turned to be 25 or later on, which exceeds women quite considerably. And in the end, I would like to say that analysis of gender composition of national uh, swimming teams make possible to assess sports swimming in different countries shown by trends. Uh, Olymp leading Olympic uh, teams, national Olympic teams, they provide similar contribution. Analyzing gender composition of medal standings show the wave-like trends indicating a, a presence of outstanding sportsmen at some specific period of time. Thank you. We'll uh, con continue with swimming. Barano Tatiana. Dynamics of temperature and functional states, uh, functional status of muscles in winter swimming uh, athletes. Good day, dear colleagues. Glad to see you in our forum. Uh, my talk today is dedicated to winter swimming. Dynamics of uh, water temperature and functional uh, mus uh, muscle function status in winter swimmers. Travel vapor is not on the day of uh, cosmonauts, but uh, also by the, the, the 12th of April, so winter swimming is not to be uh, admitted as a, as, a, as a sports type and included in the old Russian registry of sports. So there were considered uh, created associations of winter swimming. As the interest of this sport existed for a long while, but only this year, 
it passes through the second stage of fermentation and we get to the third stage of fermentation. This type of sports actually shows considerable differences from classic swimming and swimming in the open waters. First of all, with an extreme uh, cold uh, effect. And of course, such a strong effect of uh, cold on sportsmen or athletes actually provides uh, very high requirements for functional reserves. So we need to assess those reserves, to monitor them, uh, and provide a timely restoration after such a cold uh, effects. Because here we're dealing with two type, two side, so to say, impact. And new types of sports require medical, biological, rational, organizing, uh, first of all, organization of training process, accompaniment of sports at all stages of training, and uh, development of an effective rehabilitation system. Well, the winter swimming has four categories. It is ice water, from zero to two degrees Celsius. Is that freezing water? It's two to five degrees. And here, distances could be longer than cold water swim from five to nine degrees. And from, from nine to 15 degrees, the distances are not limited. Well, cold. Cold as a factor could significantly affect physical performance. Here you see the class for four sports from the age of 18 or 19 years. Of course, they adapted, but not like other sportsmen, which I'm going to des describe further. You see the red line and blue lines. Uh, blue curve shows swimming in water of the uh, cold water and red. In regular water, regular temperature water. As long as the distance, the longer is the delay. And it's, and, you, you, and it's clear why, because the body is trying to, so to say, in cold water, the body is trying to uh, retain heat. Uh, so the body redist redistributes uh, circulation in terms of, uh, or it uh, changes the, uh, uh, so to say, uh, um, heat production. You see the results of 25 meters is a bit worse than 50 yeah. meters distance. So I, it's a difference I, between I, the regular I, and cold swimming. So, our, the purpose of our body, uh, study was to study characteristics of physiological response uh, on different distances. We started 24 swimmers at the age of 22 to 15 years. So it means a huge distribution, but it's uh, but it's hard to find sportsmen well adapted to that type of uh, exertion. But of course, later on, we will have to uh, produce different age-based categories. So you see the distances, different distances, 25, 50, 100, and 200 meters. And here you see the results of, uh, uh, you see the changes of the body, of the body temperature. First, one to eight is a situation at rest. Measure temperatures at feet, chain, femur, uh, palm, uh, forearm, shoulder, neck, and scapula. You see, there are differences between 25 and 50 meters. Uh, between 50 and 100 meters, there are uh, clear differences, but between um, but between but between 50 and 100 meters, there are no clear differences. According to the self. Uh, reporting of the sports. When you go to our analysis, we can see that at the stage of, uh, at the 50 meters distance, we see the temperature factor starts to uh, be involved. The heat production factor 
his uh, heat production is turned on. So the specimen could be more successful in swimming through this 50 and 100 meters without temperature drop. It's very important, especially to uh, when we're talking about the uh, uh, so how the training should be pro uh, produced. We should know when heat production is on and which substrate can be used. In the regular, for the regular swimming, we know the glucose involved. But for winter swimming, since energy and, uh, consumption is very high, as to our uh, uh, as to our uh, observation, uh, lipid metabolism is involved on the longer distances, of course. So, what else I can say? Look at the parameter 7 and 8. It's always higher in the temperature between scapula and upper, uh, upper uh, posterior regions of neck. Why it happens? According to the tomography data, the adults as uh, kids, if you're adopted to the if you adopt it to the cold swimming, you have the brown fat. The, uh, why? Why it is important? Because uh, muscular regulation depends a lot on uh, the CNS. If CNS is effective, and it means the temperature coming to brain should stay within required, so to say, limits. And so the blood going through these areas, uh, through the, between the scapulas, it is a vertebral arteries in your occipital, go to the occipital brain areas, the blood should be of the required temperature, at least for some distances. And what else we can see? The, the 50 meter distance, you see the tension tone of the muscular performance is higher, the loss is 25. Also, it indicates that at this distance, the internal heat production is turned on. And looking at the blood pressure, then we can see that, it's, that it looks better at the distance of 50 meters. So eventually, at the end, I would like to say that we need to uh, we need to organize uh, research to study. Uh, cooling effects on the body, in particular on the muscle system, and how it affects swimming so the same technique. We should uh, study uh, cold load, how it should be combined with regular sports uh, loading, and we should develop heat resistance uh, criteria. And of course, we should study energy and plastic processes, which is necessary for proper train uh, to pro to plan the training process properly. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we've got our next uh, online talk by Evgeny Trishin, a factor of interest uh, factors on postural resistance of high qualified sportsmen involved uh, of, of, of practicing uh, gymnastics. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. I have issues with uh, screen share. Can you hear me? Again, yes, so we can see you. All right, to listen to you. <laughs> okay. I cannot turn, I'm sorry, I cannot turn on my uh, presentation. It says uh, Zoom it tells me that uh, screen sharing is off. So we cannot see the screen. I, I, I cannot turn it on. I cannot uh, start screen sharing because it was turned off for your side. Uh, okay, so just let's wait. It should be on. Wait a second. Now, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes, we can see, but can you please switch to the Full screen mode. Okay, good. Thanks a lot, dear colleagues. Good day. Thanks for the opportunity to be a speaker at the Congress. It's a great honor for me. And I'd like to start with the following. 
So today, the studies of uh, emotional state is very important, but we know that keeping your posture is a detective process. So, and uh, postural, so to say, uh, balance uh, is a very important characteristics, characteristics uh, one of the most important characteristics uh, for, so to say, rhythmic, uh, rhythmic gymnastics. So, we can say that the studies of sports posterology uh, look quite clear. Uh, we wanted to study specifics on uh, keeping balance by a highly qualified gymnast uh, on the effect of lateralized factors, uh, meaning uh, when they turn their heads. We studied 14 uh, gymnasts specialized in rhythmic gymnastics, having qualifications of Master of Sports and Master of Sports as International uh, class. And untrained uh, and and uh, untrained peers, not involved in any uh, sports activities on a regular basis, which was the methods uh, of studies. We used uh, two platform computer stabilizer, analyzer, Stabilon O1, to study vertical portion. We use a bilateral uh, test with a head turn. Primary analysis of stability kinesiograms, uh, average for both stabilograms, was uh, used, uh, was performed using seven parameters. Is a, uh, so it, it, we, we used, uh, so to say, uh, average differences, uh, average move, uh, then uh, trust. Conf Confident ellipse and others. Data was processed with a statistical 12 software. We use the following statistical parameters. Is mean arithmetic, uh, uh, mean arithmetic uh, error after the sample was checked for normality. We use the parametric student criteria uh, for, so to say, uh, for various samples. P was considered to be uh, 0.05. And for the study, we use ethical principles simulated by the declaration of Helsinki. So uh, our study results. Uh, here you see the static kinesiogram results in the test with the turn, uh, head turn for professional gymnasts and untrained peers. I will show the highly qualified sportsmen when they turn their heads to the right to the to the left, uh, they produce specific changes for keeping their postures, and it was affected by stabilogram parameters. For instance, when they turned their head to the right, uh, the tension in postural mechanisms was thought to be higher, but not quite considerably, uh, meaning that only three parameters were changed. It's uh, average changes in the uh, pressure rate and integral parameter of the quality of uh, balance function which worsened only by 3%. But when they turned their head to the left, worsened the, uh, versus, uh, uh, so to say, uh, functional te uh, te test, basic functional test, uh, the results were more significant. Uh, the drift coordinates changed by 15 to 30% in the frontal sagittal uh, plane. The average uh, movement of the 17%, the confidential ellipses uh, area changed considerably. Then uh, linear average speed changed by 17 percent. But those changes made possible for G gymnasts. Uh, to, though their uh, balance worsened, but not significantly, it was only by three percent, which is a very interesting factor, since they are untrained uh, peers, even with other. To other sports, such uh, stress to the postural mechanisms considerably changed their uh, postural parameters. Static kinesiogram data in bilateral tests with uh, head turn 
showed advantage of the gymnasts versus untrained peers. Background tests show advantages with all the stomachinesogram products. It was seen also with other sports in the in such sports activity like parkour, in the team uh, works, in uh, team games, American football or basketball, but not all sports produced such clear decrease in uh, uh, water of the balance function. In some sports, there was no, in some sports showed uh, no differences between trained and uh, sportsmen and untrained uh, peers. With a turn head to the right, as the static kinesia ground parameters uh, showed advantage of uh, uh, gymnasts. And in the, with the turn, uh, with head turn to the left, the generally parameters of gymnasts were smaller by 3%. In untrained, they decreased uh, more significantly. And also, we show specific so human adaptation to the right to the hands, they should be studied more from the point of view of uh, inter hemisphere symmetry. symmetry. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe these differences uh, could be, uh, such difference could be uh, explained by the uh, actual dexterity of sportsmen. Uh, and And the results of the study might result, uh, might result in development of specific uh, specific uh, training or specific closing training uh, process. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. In the next talk, by Elena Kukorina. Uh, comparative analysis, it's possible of different uh, Comparative analysis of more functional parameters uh, in uh, complex coordination uh, sports. Uh, uh, well, we permanent or standing improvement of the results response uh, requires development of various methods to assess mark of functional indicators, uh, considering uh, most uh, leading sportsmen involved in uh, figure uh, skating and uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and sport uh, aerobics are so just when it took, wanted to compare mark of functional parameters of, of athletes, uh, figure skaters, and uh, uh, sport aerobic athletes. We need to compare individual parameters of such athletes, finding the uh, set of microfractional parameters typical for high level sportsmen specialized in a single figure skating. Who were the year? Who, who, who was that? We took 26 sportsmen uh, you know, uh, practicing figure skating as a single adventures. And also, we uh, studied sportsmen involved in sports aerobics. Was a uh, with the uh, big muscles of the sports. We started body weight, Kettler index, uh, vital capacity lungs, and uh, other parameters. We started sports on using the Harvard step test. And to assess level of vestibular balance, we did uh, not scared robot testing uh, tests. Data were statistically processed using a start graphic plus uh, software. While comparing the produced data,
comparison of the data, so uh, the specialization of cat cloth, we see clear differences between the assets. Here you see morphological parameters, and we can see that with a similar average height, figure skaters showed lower body weight and lower uh, body mass versus aerobics uh, assets. Analysis of component composition of body weight showed clearly less of fat content in figure skaters versus aerobic uh, athletes. Studying functional uh, peculiarities of sportsmen showed that uh, aerobic athletes, they showed uh, higher performance and uh, stronger palm uh, strength parameters, while functional Well, uh, functional respiration tests showed no clear differences between sportsmen. Figure stages with a different, uh, with a similar amount of vital lung capacity, we showed a higher uh, or better results in Roman Yerotsky uh, tests, showing better vestibular balance uh, parameters versus those practicing aerobics. Though biomechanical parameters look to be quite similar, and uh, type of uh, contests, each specialization has its own set of marker functional parameters to be successful to be a successful effort in a particular sport. It is uh, confirmed. I'm sorry for that. This confirms. Importance of marker functional parameters into the end. So it confirms the importance of marker functional parameters when selected like high class sportsman, which could be used as a model uh, characteristics when uh, selecting sportsman for the highest for the highest sports uh, high sports level. Uh, groups. Thank you for your attention. And the next talk by Svetlana Ushkanova. Registration of genotype data when uh, as a factor to for objective uh, to objectively assess uh, predisposition uh, of children to specific sports. We would like to show you the data conforming that it is important to assess genetic factor uh, to assess the uh, predisposition of sports to sportsmen to uh, to avoid uh, to or to the freestyle wrestling considering that globally we used to Quite general uh, scientific information of genetic predisposition to sports. What it is studying, visualizing, I bring to the new level possibility of for individual training uh, of uh, specific assets. Implementation of uh, uh, modern achievements is a very important factor. Uh, genetics as a scientist shows objective information on predisposition to some specific activity, including sports, and to assess necessary conditions for to develop the child. Successful solution of this task is not possible without genetic modeling, which is uh, which shows us preliminary data in the child is predisposed to some specific sports and to forecast if they're going to be successful. Since there are no scientifically uh, based uh, data uh, to consider ethical factors, makes uh, more problematic to assess the uh, pr training process of uh, sportsmen. So, the purpose of the study is to assess uh, genetic uh, predisposition of the uh, uh, to the to the freestyle wrestling 
uh, to assess uh, genetic disposition of uh, children from the Northern First Nations um, to uh, freestyle wrestling. Symmetry, uh, uh, higher power dynamometry, development of respiration system, and uh, relevance of uh, height parameters uh, are we consider them to be important. And genetic uh, factors and no clear signs of physical uh, physical development uh, specifics shows that we need to assess uh, to assess uh, the uh, genetic factors. Well, at the initial stages of training, we show that uh, that uh, we, there are some spherules, there is some correspondence to federal uh, ranging. And, and so the strange uh, parameters of leg muscle and body muscles showed lower uh, general uh, performance. Some control uh, stages, as uh, for instance, like triple jump, uh, required either local uh, sides of uh, abilities not typical for wrestling or or necessary or special thing. At the first stages of this uh, stages, they showed contradictory information on sports uh, relevance, so we cannot properly assess if the children, if a child it can be uh, has a has a predisposition. So, the traditional considering the genetic factor for freestyle wrestling in in our uh, testing audience and assessment of their sports uh, preparedness, we added a procedure to study genetically set predisposition and uh, mathematic analysis of determinants for sports uh, feasibility. To, during the uh, genetic studies of the young sportsmen, we found out that universal uh, and the best variant for uh, variant of genetics was found in 43.1% of all the uh, children. So this showed genetic predisposition in children from uh, native Northern nations. So during the assessment of control tests to select the children, they showed that all the test uh, tasks, uh, according to the federal stance, they're quite well and informative, but all regarding the general uh, training of the children. Majority of those tests showed us uh, uh, non indirect assessment of the sportsman without uh, showing, uh, without showing a preparation or predisposition to specific sportsman. And we use thus special exercise to tune Ergir, uh, which is used for uh, by Yakut uh, to test if the child is uh, predisposed. It, it So it showed. Uh, Combined as in a com uh, combined assessment, it was a combined assessment. If a child is predisposed to the specific sports, was uh, so we can assume that despite of the high predisposition of young sportsmen uh, to some strength sports, there are some specific genetic types of testes which uh, implies different uh, developments and different results while training those sportsmen. Thus, using the genetic method on the group of the highly qualified wrestlers from the Northern First Nations, who are participants and uh, uh, medal winners at the Olympic Games and World Cups, uh, we managed to develop uh, special factors which are, uh, which produce the determinants to be successful in the wrestling, and which turn to be uh, turn to be the so to say uh, very important factors. Uh, numbers of factors so fact, presence of actually 5 uh, 3G shows high predisposition of the child to be a successful wrestler and development. Uh, and we look at those 35 uh, genetic predisposition factors indicates that the child is related to the specific genotype 
characterizing if a child it would be considered as a promising wrestler to perform the predisposition of a child to this process, uh, then each of the genotype predisposition was to be analyzed, uh, implying uh, physical preparedness of uh, young wrestlers uh, after the similar, so to say, training process. That the improvement of testing results among young wrestlers in six model groups uh, showed different parameters characterizing general and physical preparedness in six groups, and it shows better dynamics in those capabilities which uh, were corresponded to the closest model predispositions, predispositions of each genotype. So, development of physical parameters to uh, wrestling was related to the physical predisposition of children. And ability, uh, and the uh, ability to of their parameters to grow were related to genetic factors as well. Uh, comparative analysis of the results of this uh, uh, exercise showed that, that the best results were found in the results uh, in the terms of children closest to the model genetic. National exercise, the tender again, is very useful to assess if a child is uh, well predisposed to. Uh, wrestling. So the study results shows necessity to, to take into account genetic predisposition of children in the first stage of selection and to apply proper criteria. It shows not all the not only individual predisposition of children, but also to assess uh, specific features for training uh, among young wrestlers. Thank you. Dr. Kucharczyk, uh, um, the trajectory of professional development for medical students. Good morning, dear panel members, dear colleagues. Indeed, it is interesting to speak about medical training, uh, training of medical students, because it means that we professionally develop uh, doctors who further facilitate athletes in achieving their very high sports results. That is why today we shall be speaking about individual professional trajectory of medical students. If we speak about sports medicine, then I'd like to say a couple of words about the uh, key positions. First of all, we base upon traditions of medical schooling. Second, we take into account international experience from different countries. It's important for us. We conduct a number of studies within uh, athlete medicine uh, related to genetics, omics technology, and different fields of medicine, which are interweaved into sports medicine. Also, we have innovations related to different comprehensive systems within a sports medicine and different innovative technologies, all these uh, finds its way into medical schooling. I should say that regulations indeed is uh, rather complicated, it's complex, it is not unresolved completely, it has a number of issues to look at. We need professional standards in medical education, which is at the moment under discussion because in education, when we have certain targets, aims and goals, we should take into account professional standards. Um, professional trajectory in doctors, or training doctors, doctors in sports medicine, means that we need to train, start with uh, schools, with medical schools. This is not professional training, this is uh, medical students. And uh, when we analyze international experience or just implementing this block or introducing this block of education in different medical schools and medical facilities, we understood, first of all, that they have different disciplines trained or taught. It is not always structured. And I should say that different universities, even within one country, would uh, result to different programs, technologies, and approaches. Students definitely are enjoy this uh, type of training, and uh, some universities even skip it. 
if you analyze all of these programs, they have something in common as well. First of all, from the minimum theory uh, of sports training up to in-depth studies of sports medicine in the postgraduate stage. In Russia, we also have quite, compre uh, quite complex and quite uh, different trainings, uh, and they, this would depend on the medical school or medical university. What are the directions that we need to include into our curriculum? First of all, this is based upon evidence. The, the thing is that we have uh, problems with the hours of tuition because the program is over uh, overloaded. We would like to teach them everything, all the opportunities. Some say that uh, they do sports, that that's enough. I shouldn't agree with this, but nonetheless, such opinion uh, can be, you can come across it. Also, very high qualification uh, staffing is needed in our Almaz uh, Center. This is cardiology facility in St. Petersburg. It's federal cardiology facility. We have special uh, educational trajectory which includes four tracks, and one of them is sports medicine. I suppose that we can uh, do this thanks to the collaboration with other uh, facilities, such as the uh, sports university named after Lesdov, because actually we have been developing this curriculum together. This is not a networking program, but it, it includes a huge amount of networking. So there is simulation trainings, uh, biochemistry, summer school up to the third course of training, there are also elective courses. And then after the third year, they would actually determine the further field of major. Apart from sports medicine, there is also artificial intelligence in uh, the healthcare, personalized medicine, because we are part of the international community on, of personalized medicine. So sports medicine is just one group per year, not more. Special, uh, speciality is open for the first time this year. Uh, next year, we shall have the first graduates. All in all, we have 25 people trained under this curriculum. You can see all the disciplines, like uh, medical rehabilitation and uh, medical physical training and so on and so forth so wellness medicine and uh, the green is the sixth year of training this is something we are uh, working on it is not implemented yet what's the difference of this trajectory from the others we would like to include a lot of practical hands-on experience um, hands-on classes and a number of elective courses as well as the research activity if we speak about scientific and practical approaches on sports medicine. There are multiple, I, I'm not going to speak long about them, to implement this program. We need a number of practices. First of all, these are different universities that take into account. And, uh, this is Lesgovka University Almazov Center and other facilities alongside with which we cooperate or collaborate in order to improve this program. We would like to have many more facilities uh, within the program because our um, students need to practice in different uh, settings. This is something that our students uh, say about the program, their reviews. Uh, they say that it really broadens their horizons and uh, only 34% of uh, students wanted to become uh, sports medicine doctors. And they uh, definitely mentioned that these were very interesting meetings with um, new, uh, very interesting doctors. They also started doing sports more frequently after that. And one of the options here is Almas of Club. These are guys who deal with sports medicine. They organized a running club in Almazov Center, which at the moment includes more than 60 people. And the head of this club is our student of the first fifth year, 
who is our student, student of this sports medicine program. So they do not take the part of running and doing medicine. They try to structure everything. And their main slogan is from the basis of fundamental medicine through structured training to success in future profession. Also, our students reviewed that we can improve on the program. They need more practice, more hands-on experience. They want summer schools. They want additional elective courses, despite the fact that they have tougher agenda and more practice and so on and so forth. I suppose that when they elect something, when they select something, they, they would say they want more, they want this and that, and uh, that's why they want more selection or wider selection of elective courses. This year we won a competition, uh, a sports competition among the universities and medical schools of St. Petersburg, and in conclusion of my presentation, I would like to say that we invite every facility to cooperate because we want wider selection of scientific research and summer school practices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now the next presentation. The cardiovascular system from Absit Panipa. No, he's not here. Uh, no, he is not here. Now, Igor Levshen, is he here? Okay. Now, we're going to speak about hypoxia in athletes and sensitivity of their body system. Okay, so the presenter is Dr. Levshen. Dear colleagues, I would like to speak on the assessment of sustainability and the uh, sensitivity of response of the organism to hypoxia on the uh, inhalation is from the Stange group. So, dear colleagues, this uh, research is quite actual because we need to speak about the additional ways and opportunities of improving sensitivity and uh, susceptibility of um, an uh, athlete to hypoxia and improvement of the self-regulation skills among the extreme professions and athletes. And, uh, before I move on to the body of my talk, I would like to demonstrate some historical uh, facts. It is not a secret that there are such methods of sustainability which we have been using for quite long. And I would like to say that there are also proper names which we don't know, the proper names of scientists that stand behind this or that breakthrough. So we looked into this matter, how the students, how far they are informed about using the Pasternatsky sim symptom, if they know anything about Pasternatsky, who was the um, discoverer of this symptom, for instance. And after such tests, we determined that none of the students using this Pasternatsky method, for example, knew that that scientist worked in the military medical academy and it, he was the head of the department. To a certain extent, it can be also relevant to Vladimir Adolfovich Stanke. In practice of the medical and biological research, we widely use the um, method that he proposed back in the 19th century. And uh, so I would like to say that this slide shows you the description of his life, 
uh, the breath holding technique that he used. The breath holding test of asphyxia can be performed in any setting. It's quite simple. It doesn't require any equipment. During this test, the major factors are accumulation of um, hydrogen dioxide and the reduction of uh, oxygen in the alveolar and the alveolars, which um, reduces saturation of arterial blood with oxygen. So if we speak about the body reserves, then we should say that uh, the activity of gas transportation is increased, such as the um, uh, cardiac, um, and also a subjective impact, such as a hypercapnia and uh, a hypoxia. So that means it is a uh, resistance to stress. At the moment, we try to test these methods. Um, and also, we try to um, uh, register the blood saturation under the oxyhemoglobin, which allows us to activate the uh, resistance of body system and also assess the uh, resistance to stress. So we talked about such parameters as particle output as well, and uh, we um, tested this among participants, 12 participants, uh, may, all males in the age group between 23, 30, all healthy. So these breath holding test uh, conditions were similar among all of uh, the subjects. Uh, some breath holding for two minutes, uh, for, for then uh, two minutes of rest. And uh, in the sitting position, there was another breath holding test for five minutes. Every five seconds, we registered the parameter of HPO2 as well as the heart rate. Also, the dynamics of registered indicators, uh, which were assessed uh, according to blood set, uh, oxygen blood saturation as well as the heart rate. As a result of this study, at the first stage in the breath holding, we have persistent uh, a steady level of blood oxygenation. Further on, there is reduction of uh, SpO2. Further, Breath holding results in the progressive reduction of oxygenation. After we stop breath holding, the saturation curve continues going down, reaching its minimum. And later on, after the initiation of breathing, it uh, reduces back to the norm. The results of these curves are shown on the further slide. It also attracts our attention to the further intervals. So the first is uh, the saturation curve. The second uh, period of time is the onset and further reduction of saturation. And the third interval is the restoration curve uh, up to the normal parameter. As a result, the analysis uh, brought us to the following outcomes. This Stange test can be interpreted the following way. First, this is the sum of the first two intervals. And if it is unsatisfactory, it should account for 40, 41, 40 seconds. Between 41 and 50, it's satisfactory. To over 51, it's good. Additionally, there is an opportunity to assess any uh, willing uh, will of uh, a subject. That means uh, to hold breathing uh, for, for longer time and uh, uh, suffer through uh, minimal parameters of SpO2. I suppose 
that uh, also it is interesting to assess the time of uh, restoring of this curve after the norm, also assessing the processes within the body system, as well as the uh, um, period of, re of restoration or recuperation. So the function disapprovement of the body system uh, correlates with the minimal time of blood oxygenation and also the uh, velocity or speed of recuperation. So uh, it can actually give us um, information about the uh, significance of a static reaction of an athlete and also uh, his exhaustion. It gives us also an opportunity to assess how a patient, uh, how a subject can adapt to the force of, uh, or to the power of irritation as a process which can also happen uh, because of the ready functional systems within the body system. For example, uh, adaption to hypoxia, which is done by the breathing system or respiratory system or the system of regulating oxygen uh, balances within the body system. This system includes such organs as uh, respiratory system, uh, blood uh, hemopoietic system, as well as the uh, blood circulation system, as well as the respiratory um, minute volumes, uh, blood, uh, blood volume, as well as the tissue respiration with the center within the nervous and the humoral system within the working organs. In conclusion, I would like to say that thus the technology of tests, the well-known to us Stange test with breath holding gives us additional data and allows, allows us to uh, achieve good additional parameters about our subject. Also, we can assess the reserves of the uh, external respiration system, as well as the level of motivation and uh, the will of a subject. As a result, we have uh, objective and more informative diagnostics, as well as the diagnostics of, of or in the functional condition of a sportsman. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And the next presenter will come uh, will be Nailotov, Alexander Nailotov. He will speak about the hyperventilation and the regulation system as a result of adaptation or as a, as a parameter of adaptation. Excuse me. Good afternoon, dear participants of the Congress. Uh, so uh, I should say that strength is very important in many types of sports. As a result, uh, there is a changed pattern of breathing. So the hyperventilation can be analyzed and this strength training uh, exercises and the mechanism is uh, nonetheless uh, not is understudied. We suppose that the main mechanism is the changes within the alkaline system, the so-called respiratory alkalosis. But if you compare similar studies in metabolic alkalosis, I mean changes of pH in the blood after you use certain additives. In the similar changes, you do not observe uh, as high uh, strength productivity. So we suppose that hyperventilation gives us additional mechanisms which are not understudied at the moment. As individual reactions of our subjects showed to be different. Somebody has more effective, others less effective. We decided to draw a correlation and 
indications of this system as these respiratory and the cardiovascular systems are interweaned, we decided to analyze the correlation um, and uh, uh, see how this uh, cardiovascular system uh, influences hyperventilation in uh, the We had different power lifts, uh, lifters or, um, uh, who were doing chest press in the sitting position. Five, min uh, five minutes cardiorhythmograms was analyzed after the hyperventilation. This hyperventilation was, uh, for, for, was done for 40 uh, seconds and they were instructed properly. We uh, conducted the activity if somebody was not taking the deep the breath deep enough, we needed maximum ventilation. We actually encouraged them to deep breathe or you know, to breathe deeper. At the second stage, after variability changes were achieved, uh, they were doing chest press. So with the interval between the sessions of five minutes. In the cases when it, it was done within two days, thus in the protocol A, there was hyperventilation between the first, the third, and the fifth sessions of chest pressing. And in protocol B, it was in the, odd, in the, in the even sessions. And in the protocol A, in the odd, uh, the hyperventilation was done in the last 40 seconds before experimental sessions of chest pressing. These are results of hyperventilation. Uh, there was statistically significant difference in the second and in the fourth uh, sessions of chest pressing. Uh, the summary sessions within two days, I mean six uh, sessions with hyperventilation and six without, we determined statistically significant enlargement. Uh, this uh, slide shows individual uh, differences in the effectiveness of hyperventilation in chest pressing. Thus, you can see that in four out of 18 subjects, you can observe absence of any effect or even reduction of number of repeats. And also there are certain subjects who increase the number of repeats after hyperventilation from 10 to 30%. One of the subjects you can see, there were 12 more repeats after hyperventilation in two, nine, and in the rest from four to seven. We also conducted a correlation analysis between hyperventilation and effectiveness of using this. Uh, we compared it to the number of repeats added. So the mean correlation, and also we analyzed the parasympathetic activity of the nervous system, such as and, you know, the square root, from the uh, cardio, uh, su uh, succession of cardio intervals and also the uh, neighboring cardio intervals, uh, different from one another more than uh, 15 milliseconds, as well as the spectrum analysis uh, indicator, which uh, also reflected the parasympathetic activity. You can see the reaction of hyper to hyperventilation was evident, it was parasympathetic regulation difference. And it can tell us about the fact that there is individual dif there are individual differences, and they can be reflected in increased number of repeats. So in those athletes where there is hyperventilation most effective, then parasympathetic reaction will also be observed in them. According to variability, 
parameters, we can interpret it as improved adaptation capacity in these patients or these subjects, excuse me. And also, we can suppose that this particular mechanism can be an adaptation type of mechanism which contra contradicts uh, to the um, vascular sh uh, vessel shrinkage. Uh, for example, you know that in hypoxia or hyperventilation, the um, vessels of the brain react in a certain way, and it will uh, also um, can cause this reaction. So parasympathetic regulation stops this uh, uh, narrowing of the vessels. Thus, patient, uh, our subjects can be more effective with hyperventilation. Thank you very much. But we need to continue our studies. Thank you very much. We're going to continue with the hyperventilation. Uh, Dmitry Anisimov will be the next speaker. He will speak about the influence of hyperventilation over the functional condition of the brain, as well as the power lift uh, capacity. <clears throat> Hello, dear participants of the conference. Today, we're going to speak about the influence of hyperventilation over the functional condition of the brain. Power lifting is a sport which involves lifting very uh, heavy weights, it requires additional um, strength and development of additional strength of our athletes. We think that a complex of breathing exercises can help us and provide additional benefit of proper ventilation. We also suppose that short-term voluntary hyperventilation would um, exacerbate the brain cortex as well as improve synchronization between motion units as a result functional improve, improved function of the muscles. Short-term hyperventilation can be very effective in uh, making our efforts stronger. Our target is to determine hyperventilation uh, and physical capacity of the brain. And we use chest pressing as an exercise as well. Uh, our study comprised two stages. First is encephalography in the field conditions, 20 subjects. Hyperventilation was done within last 14 seconds within first, third, and fifth sessions. And on other days, it was two, four, and six sessions. So hyperventilation, the subject was in the lying position, says six sessions within uh, several uh, presses or bench presses. This graph shows that the sessions before, which were preceded by hyperventilation um, in this particular uh, bench press, the number of repeats were much higher. The overall sum of repeats or presses after the hyperventilation was uh, about 45.86 and 41 without hyperventilation. With the preliminary hyperventilation uh, shows us statistically significant difference. The second stage, laboratory studies, 12 uh, athletes, 12 uh, subjects in the age between 20 and 28, hyperventilation and bioelectric activity by EEG of the brain was studied. EEG was registered continuously within the study. It also included two protocols, similar to the previous. The EEG sensors were covered by uh, the system 1020, 17 leads in the frontal, uh, temporal, and excluding the um, temporal, occipital, but not, not temporal, not to have the artifacts as well as the um, 
lobe and the uh, occipital uh, muscle. This is the EEG. By EEG, we also determine the amplitude of the main bioelectric activity, such as alpha, uh, in at rest and also operative, operative rest, uh, alert, alert and uh, uh, beta one, as well as theta activity, emotional stress, and delta. This is bioelectrical activity in the relaxation and sleep. The breathing rate was uh, assessed by the application, by Wim Hof methods. In the absolute parameters, we uh, allowed us to detect statistically significant capacity of in uh, beta, alpha, and gamma uh, ranges after the hyperventilation. If compared to lack of hyperventilation, you can see that such parameters as delta beta in the sessions with hyperventilation were significantly higher. In conclusion, I should say that all the above mentioned shows me that the preliminary 40 second hyperventilation before uh, physical exercise such as chest press or bench press allows us to improve the number of um, repeats and also the bioelectric activity in the leads after hyperventilation is significantly higher if compared to the sessions without preliminary hyperventilation. We can suppose that the brain cortex is exacerbated by hyperventilation, which improves the afferent neurons activity in the pyramidal pathway and improves uh, synchronization of motor units, which allows us to have good muscular response. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. I suppose that it is high time for us to make a short um, break. We have some time, 20 minutes for Q&A. And we can discuss um, I would like to start by um, expressing my deep gratitude to a uh, specialist from hospital number 14 who provided us with great uh, information about the rehabilitation center in our city, in our region. I would like to thank you for also commemorating those people who worked in that hospital during the Second World War and the achievements that you are demonstrating currently at different stages of medical rehabilitation when you actually uh, rehabilitate people and make them walk again and uh, live their full lives again, uh, something we couldn't do previously. Also, I was very happy to, to hear specialists from uh, remodeling and also a, a remodeling unit. When in athletes we have remodeling or something else. In my practice, we look at the ejection fraction mainly on the uh, end diastolic volume. And um, in different types of sports, it, it works differently with such bradycardia. I do not see such bradycardia cases, but it happens. It happens. There are so many phenomena that gives us food for thought. Remodeling indeed is a difficult and complicated process. And I did not see the ejection fraction part in your presentations. My colleagues from overseas, I suppose they are okay with the sizes and figures. They consider that if ejection fraction is okay, the athlete can go on training. Disregarding the thicknesses and the volumes and so on. You know that the techniques actually, they do a lot. This ECG of the heart, and then the doctor just assesses the figures, whether the ejection fraction is uh, relevant or not. 
just give a small comment on how you, um, I must apologize, the microphone is not in use. The microphone is not in use. Translation is not possible. I must apologize, translation is not possible. The microphone is not in use. Please use the microphone. Ejection fraction is relevant in 2D and in 3D. So we had certain hypotheses in terms of applying new technology, for example, speckle tracking uh, ECG, which by a number of international um, research allows us to detect subclinical uh, heart failure, which can be detected earlier than uh, we assess traditional parameter of uh, ejection fraction. And with the evidence that we have nowadays with the current regulations, uh, the regulations are in place for um, healthy people, but then uh, the regulations are not in place for athletes. We detected lower uh, parameters of the uh, prolonged strain in professional athletes. That was a peculiar feature. When it comes to the remodeling, we have traditional classification that we apply, taking into account the relevant myocardial wall thickness, uh, myocardial mass, so the types of remodeling which are traditionally described and discussed, and we use them in our uh, in our study, in our research. Okay, yeah, I understand this. This is actually very good. There is a question about standardizing the tests because our colleagues made a presentation speaking about whether we need to standardize tests. I don't know uh, if there are three, uh, sites, three settings, of course they should be standardized, but when it comes to echo, there are certain ratings of the echo equipment. They have their own ratings in terms of reproducibility, for example, of results. And I suppose you would verify this. Yes, that's a very good comment. In our department, we have, and we have one of the best uh, ultrasound park of equipment, I would say fleet of equipment even, the they come from GE. It's not. It's far from being an advertising part, but they are uh, state of the art. And when we apply 3D, they are not operator dependent, or the operator dependence is lower. They have good geometry, which is very important for athletes. We should take into account the geometry in the repetition of stress, and. Thus, uh, well experienced operators with the uh, experience of over 10 years, and also there is a system of post treatment po uh, follow up of our scans. The manufacturer also gave us an opportunity in the laboratory conditions to do the calculation of parameters. Yes, thank you. Any other questions to the speaker to hospital number 14, who are in the forefront at the moment? Thank you very much for coming over to our conference. Thank you for very interesting presentations. And um, you know, we are going to move on asking questions. The next um, question is standardizing the tests. The speaker is not here. I suppose we should nonetheless discuss it because standardizing the test uh, can be quite relevant. But uh, the unified database for the sportsmen uh, with the open access, I suppose this is not good. As I have been working with the athletes for quite long, I should say that if I use information about other athletes, then my athlete will just uh, beat that athlete, athlete, not because of sports, but because I actually analyze him correctly. If there is one athlete with uh, resilience and the other one is not resilient, for example, then uh, uh, we should just, um, uh, so to say, use this as strategic benefits. So this unified database for sports, I suppose, should not be relevant. They should be closed. They should be protected. I don't know, Vladimir, what would you say? Maybe in your country that would be different. It's quite difficult. 
to say in Russian, but I will say that this database can be used in the situation with trauma. Yes, we should probably understand what happens with the trauma because uh, most frequently uh, they, this data is closed. We don't know what happens inside the team. And frequently we see at conferences that uh, there were some uh, traumas, some injuries at this or that, in this or that team. So uh, th this is where we need some access to the data most probably. Okay, that's uh, a question. It's a pity that the uh, speaker, the initiator of this discussion actually uh, has, left, uh, the, uh, has left the room. So when it comes to microcirculation, Dear colleagues, maybe you will support me now, or maybe not. If the microcirculation reacts asymmetrically to some impact, for example, the fences uh, in the hand where they have this, um, which is the working hand, the microcirculation will be higher. I suppose that neurologists will be very surprised because we are quite symmetrical, we must certain, have certain symmetrical re, uh, reactions in our hands, for example. The microphone. Yes, the thing is that a functional test at rest, there is no difference, but the functional test, it's a occlusion uh, test, the uh, blood circulation reserves are higher because of the lower indications at rest. Although at rest, it's not statistically significant, but there is a trend. If we speak about main vessels, my colleagues demonstrated that the diameter of vessels is different in the leading hand. It's more adapted because of the muscular activity. So this is a trend. It doesn't actually mean uh, that in a peculiar feature, the reactions would be adequate they would be relevant, but the blood circulation would be different. Yes, most probably I have worded it in a different way. Yes, I was a little bit, I, uh, okay, what about circulation, microcirculation? I suppose that the technology is interesting enough because it's Minimax actually, they've been uh, experimenting with the uh, Doppler and the nail beds uh, also. This is the so-called blind methods. The functional, uh, most probably, guys will uh, remember this when we have uh, the Doppler. It's not the vessel, but uh, the flow is assessed. Okay. I'm the most uh, inquisitive, I should say. Nobody else has questions. When it comes to winter swimming, that's the presentation that struck me, really. The author is here. That's great. I'm very happy that this type of swimming is a recognized type of sport at the moment. And uh, coming from the, from uh, you should not be diving in the cold water. I just remember from my uh, own uh, swimming practice, how do they swim actually in winter? The fact is that I have been doing, I have been dealing with the vegetative conflict and that's why I have come to this type of sport and I started uh, dealing with these athletes. At the moment we are discussing whether this type of sport uh, can be practiced by all because of the vegetative activity to the cold water. There is very high activity of parasympathetic system. Uh, so that means it feeding the heart rates as a response to diving. But I was struck. On the one hand, we saw this. More than 2.5 thousand patients underwent it. But people continue swimming and they swim long distances, which is striking. It's overwhelming. We actually are dealing with them at the moment. We have a number of studies. They swim differently. There is Finnish type grass swimming. When they do not dive, they do not put their faces in the water. But nonetheless, they dive. Uh, some of them dive. So criteria of risk groups, this is something that we're currently dealing with. This is our paramount goals of research, I mean, detecting people who can do it. 
that in cold water, in high reactivity, high reaction, there can be uh, impeding of the Meyer-Cartian function. This is exactly what we're dealing with. And this is exactly something that we need to study. Whether it is true that the swimmers have a very high risk of um, sudden death from embolic events, fatty embolism. Uh, speaking about it, I suppose it's interesting indeed. I have not looked into this, but the lipid metabolism is different. It's increased in these people. I was struck by the following. In the cold water swimming, glucose it doesn't go down. Glucose level doesn't go down. It, it is increased. We started looking at the biochemistry and we understood that glycerol goes up, but the fatty acids go down. So lipid metabolism is increased, but this is for long uh, distance cold water swimmers. This is about 500 meters, 800 meters, not for short, uh, short term. And the overall lipid amount doesn't go up. The fatty acids, they go down. It's quite difficult, actually. How you can swim long in the cold water. How does this training look like? How frequently they train? Yes, there is a question. Because there is the uh, swimmers, when they just start, if they have no instructor, when they have no coach, they try to overtrain. And after one season, they stop. Because there is so-called cold fatigue, cold fatigue. This is what occurs. So that's why it's not uh, two times per week. So they go to the swimming pool with regular temperature of water, and just two times per week, they go to the cold water swimming. But there is no single standard of training at the moment. I suppose that's another extreme type of sport, and we don't know where it will result, and where it will finish, what it will result in. This is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And what we actually saw is that even if there is no high reactivity, but in long-term swimming, there is a um, QT interval which uh, is enlarged, which can also result in the heart attack. It happens after he finishes, finishes swimming. He comes out of the water and he loses consciousness. What about testing? Uh, or what, what, what about exercising? before going to this cold water swimming. Uh, just imagine he swims into, or he dives into the cold water, and there is a spring for 200 meters. It's interesting how they warm up before it. Even the third accreditation it has not been received. There is no one integral system. You can only uh, utilize the experience at the moment that our coaches have, coaches in winter, swimming sports. These are unofficial methods. Every coach has a method of their own. One would uh, warm them up in the dry conditions. Others say that they need to warm up in the water, already in the cold water. Okay, that's good. But there is no one single system. Just swim in the cold water. Just imagine that. Okay. That's very interesting comment. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, any questions from the floor? I have a question. Colleagues who are dealing with hyperventilation. So hyperventilation and culmination, uh, do you actually have you studied that? No, not yet. We are going to have this as our future goal. Thank you. It's been so nice to see the colleagues from Almazov Center. Here we have been uh, dealing with them for quite long. It's quite a big problem to train medical uh, specialists in the area of sports and uh, athletism. At the moment, we're going to have three centers in Russia. 
So the necessity is really big. We need uh, new strategies uh, in, the, in the regions of Russia. There are programs which are being formed. And the fact that Almazov Center is an innovative platform who work alongside with the Lesgaft institution. I suppose, are you with us? Very nice, Andrina. What about innovations? Dear uh, Andrei Vizoslavovich, we actually have many more innovations and we try to do as much as possible. We try to uh, implement this idea of creating an innovative platform uh, in order to train doctors within uh, sports. It's Moscow and St. Petersburg and Novosibirsk in Siberia. We see already what should be changed and modified. We already accumulated certain experience. We have new standards at the moment of, in education, which uh, gives us an opportunity to take into account all the uh, mistakes that were made previously and make uh, these specialists much better trained. I would like to share this information with you. Uh, last year at the chair of the Department of Rehabilitation and Sports Medicine in Pediatric Medical University, there were just 15, uh, 15 students were enrolled. Sports medicine. But only a few of them decided to go into sports medicine. They mainly go to the um, physical training, physical education. So generally speaking, there is a discrepancy. Yes, this year, I suppose in spring or something like that, we had a meeting with, uh, with resident doctors. But these resident doctors who are part of the Sports medicine programs, um, they say that they want sports medicine more than um, just uh, medical, physical training. They want additional programs. They want more specific training on sports medicine. This is a change that we have seen this year only. This therapeutic exercise is becoming less popular than sports medicine. So this uh, especially in rehabilitation medicine and physical medicine, I mean, which embraces both therapeutic exercise, physical therapy, and uh, you know, sports medicine. To become such a specialist, you need some professional development from it, it, it covers over 1,000 hours of tuition. Is it going to be like that? Hospital 40, do you have the same problem? It's, it's way too long. So at the moment, it is really so. And at the moment, it is just a gossip. It's not implemented yet. Oh, that's good. Dear colleagues, more questions. No microphone in use. The State Duma introduced new specialty, specialists on sports medicine, in order to improve uh, responsibility sure. of doctors for the use of doping in sports, uh, whether uh, it is correlated with the sports medicine anyhow, and they give us a chance just to say that this is a, a specialist who belongs to medicine, to, uh, to medicine. I will explain. So uh, all the specialists, all the personnel members, they are responsible nowadays for the doping. They, it's not only the sports specialist. We're going to have uh, presentations tomorrow devoted to this. 
we have the online speaker. So we're finishing our session with an online presentation by Shuri uh, specialist uh, on the vet, uh, who, who uh, deals with the veterans of sports. Dear panel members, dear colleagues, the aim of my presentation is to attract attention to the problems of cardiovascular health in the veterans of sport. Um, professionally, I have witnessed for quite a long period of time uh, different diseases in veterans of sports of different levels, starting from the candidates to sports masters Master, sports masters and uh, honorary, uh, honorary sports masters. This professional feature of my activity allows me to accumulate certain experience which I would like to share with you. Indeed, there is no doubt that the cardiovascular system should be adapted to regular exertion especially the heart, the structural changes can be witnessed, the functional as well as the electrical activity modifications can be observed. Electrical activity can be uh, monitored by the ECG dynamics. And for the younger athletes, we have agreement, we have reached agreement when it comes to the normal ECG parameters and modified ones on exertion, I mean, voltage signs of, hy uh, of uh, uh, ventricular hypertrophy, as well as the inversion of the uh, T peak uh, in V1, V3 in people below 16 years of age, sinus bradycardia and or sinus arrhythmia, ectopic um, uh, atrial or nodular rhythm, a V block of the first second stage for the first type. In pediatricians, these changes can result in certain suspicion, but the sports doctors and cardiologists are all right about these changes. And there are certain signs of the atrium enlargement, as well as the, the HPV block. And the, generally speaking, uh, there are certain, if there are no symptoms, this will be perceived completely normally, just like the signs of adaptive hypertrophy uh, of the left ventricle, which can be characterized with the muscular and collagen structures modifications, but the homogeneity will be retained and the diastolic function of the left ventricle will also be intact. It's quite clear that such exertion as the ones that are demonstrated on this slide when lifting a heavy weights in a patient, the systolic blood pressure can be almost 400 millimeter and or rowers can show systolic blood pressure of 220 and diastolic 100 millimeters. It's quite clear that it is not left unnoticed. Well, with those uh, changes, the some uh, some issues which uh, seem to be unnoticed uh, or not important initially, uh, they uh, tend to be more relevant, more significant. If a person continues with his uh, sports activities uh, or we see with aging. Uh, appearance accumulation of uh, various uh, risk factors facilitating atherosclerosis uh, progression. Sports and athletes, they also do smokes and lots of issues uh, with nutrition, with diet. So we see a whole set uh, of factors initiating atherosclerosis. 
high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, if and if there is some specific genetic predisposition, and uh, if we talk about men continuing uh, with the intensive uh, uh, exertion, exercise, intensive training, we know about clear danger, especially in a high class uh, sportsmen. They see more of uh, atherosclerotic plaques forming uh, finally myocardial fibrosis. This uh, repeating mechanical stress, in particular with, uh, with very high uh, blood pressure peaks, which I mentioned already, they form mechanic uh, damage of uh, arterial intima predisposed to atherosclerosis. Uh, including uh, low symptomatic uh, one. And that's why one of the uh, most frequent cause of sudden death in athletes after 35 years of age is atherosclerosis, which actually is found only after sudden death event. And of course, age is a factor facilitating development of pro-inflammatory status uh, like uh, like a chronic uh, non-intense inflammation, which, as we do know now, is a basic, uh, is a fundamental for all those atherosclerotic cascade events. And quite recently, there was published a study where the authors followed up sportsmen of the age of 55 and older, and they followed up the changes of coronary uh, calcium uh, score uh, and the uh, number of atherosclerotic plugs, including uh, calcified ones. Well, this uh, within the study, uh, sportsmen uh, the yeslis continued with uh, some exertion, and it was found out during the follow-up, the coronary calcium uh, score considerably increased in its uh, high values, and uh, number of asymptomatic plaques also uh, grew. So no matter which sports you practice, those uh, biological trends, which are related to old age, they also take place. Very short uh, case. A man, such a male, such a nine years of age, a uh, sports master, uh, uh, and uh, in 2009, he had high blood, he was diagnosed to have high blood pressure. Uh, and uh, lipid lowering therapy was also offered. Uh, but uh, in 2017, he developed GOAT, which uh, manif was manifested with uh, GOAT arthritis. And uh, in 2022, due to the stable, persistent ventricular extrasystolar day type, uh, stress echocardiography was done. And uh, I should say, neither before nor during significant exertion when doing stress testing. Uh, they were finding they were finding no discomfort or chest pain and also there were no changes in ECG. Test uh, was positive uh, considered positive as to echo CG data with uh, because after the exhaustion, a zone of, of dyskinesia was found. Also a specific, also a specific size. It was an indication for coronarography and thus stenosis of left coronary artery stem was found uh, of 80%. But nevertheless, patient has no complaints, 
elected for standing was done, and patient uh, was uh, provided with properly modified uh, therapy. The second issue I would like to briefly uh, dwell upon is atrial fibrillation in uh, all the uh, athletes, in all the athletes. Well, clinical studies showed that sportsmen, or former sportsmen, or sports uh, veterans, uh, they develop more frequently atrial fibrillation versus their peers. And uh, this is uh, this clinical station is confirmed by the data of various publications. That's a publication of uh, 2009. Showing quite clearly that it's unlike uh, patients not practicing sports, almost all studies dedicated to the issue, they showed more frequent uh, atrial fibrillation in former sportsmen. So it has some theoretic uh, predisposing uh, factors. So mechanism of development for uh, atrial fibrillation is different in sportsmen versus non-sportsmen. While in non-sportsmen, the main cause of atrial fibrillation is diastolic dysfunction, which produces a large uh, left atrium, elevated uh, pulmonary artery pressure uh, with uh, distension mechanism provoking inflammation uh, with, uh, uh, with an outcome of fibrosis and atrial fibrillation. Uh, and in sports and, or athletes practicing intensive exertion, similar processes are provoked by physical exertion, distension of the left uh, atrium, inflammation of its walls, uh, with further fibrosis, and uh, atrial fibrillation at the end, uh, eventually. Well, and unlike non athletes, uh, Elevated or enlarged, uh, enlarged left atrium is typical for athletes, uh, along with uh, uh, along with uh, physical exertion. And atrial when atrial fibrillation uh, appears, there is no clear growth of uh, left atrium um, uh, volume. And the same is led to the end diastolic volume of the left ventricle. You can see here that regular physical activity and uh, and uh, average intensity physical exertion they have protective effect regarding atrial fibrillation, but clear significant sport-like high-level physical exertion regretfully results in elevated rate of atrial fibrillation. But nevertheless. Current methodical guidelines of the Russian Federation, they clearly describe those situations when atrial fibrillation is going to be the, uh, the described situations when the heart fibrillation is a clear uh, problem for further uh, sports practicing. Uh, and, and there's and the situations when the short uh, um, atrial fibrillation starts to be not an issue of always those specific sports. And quote in the document, I would like to mention that the anticoagulants, which are considered as a necessary component of, for you know, patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, they uh, show some peculiarities uh, depending on the sports you practice. And, and depending on the their compatibility with our specific uh, sports. And uh, talking about that, I would like to mention quite an old case. It's a male, 76 years old, of age, a master, sports master in the speed skating. Uh, the, our, our last contact, we knew about a permanent form of arterial fibrillation, bradycystole, which is typical for Westlands. And it is well known, uh, it was well known for five years. Patients came to a doctor because his sports physician referred him because he didn't know whether this person could be allowed for 
veteran contest, but he refused of uh, dynamic follow-up. And for four years, he's, uh, he continued to participate in sports quite successfully, while eventually, during the contest, he had to stop the contest because of the, uh, because of the so to say, uh, palpitations uh, and uh, weakness. Thus, he was refused of uh, refused in national contest, but he continued with uh, international contest. And in uh, 2018, he was awarded with a he won with a silver medal of the European uh, Championship. And the only uh, drug he took was aspirin, 75 uh, milligrams per day, and it was his own decision. With that particular sportsman. Uh, we can see complete uh, negation of the disease and uh, aiming for continuing the considerable physical exertion. And uh, the second thing is that aspirin wasn't quite indicated there. It is a formal uh, uh, indications. It was a borderline situation and articles maybe were not required. So we could lower the therapy was quite uh, seemed to be quite well indicated, but as I said, patient refused of uh, follow up. And at the end of my uh, brief uh, presentation, I would like to word out my ideas about the issue which I tried to lighten up. Well, sure, sure enough, that when a sportsman, when an athlete uh, reaches uh, the age of 50, 55, 60 plus, uh, then not uh, his or her sports uh, history prevails, but uh, age associated atherosclerotic uh, abnormalities. And that's why clinical signs of atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, coronary heart disease, atrial fibrillation, chronic heart failure in patients of 60 plus being athletes in the younger years, they're not different from uh, peers without any history of intensive sports. So they should be treating, uh, treated according to existing clinical guidelines. But again, sure enough that this history of intensive sports uh, practicing, uh, practice should be taken into account when treating such patients. We should take the, into account the psychological features, their uh, uh, their habit to stay healthy uh, and uh, desire to be physically active. Their functional uh, features should be considered. Many sports veterans they are highly uh, physically active and they uh, they can tolerate uh, quite well uh, physical exertion, even in case of asymptomatic and, and progressive atherosclerosis including coronary arteries, uh, uh, lesions. And uh, also those patients, they have some morphological peculiarities, in particular, uh, in peculiarities in uh, structural heart changes, happens, uh, which happened due to uh, sports practice. And also they could be, uh, they, so to say, uh, intersect with uh, disease-related heart uh, lesions. In any case, these uh, such persons should be followed up because they do intensive uh, sports exertion and, uh, and if their uh, heart can adopt or cardiovascular system it can adopt to uh, sports to intensive sports practice should it should be decided by the uh, physician or treatment physician. Okay, dear colleagues, I will now go to have a break. Uh, we have a, we have a stand exhibition with water stocks, so we sh we will reconvene at three p.m. to continue our work. Thank you.
Hello once again, dear colleagues. I suppose that we are on to start our second part of discussion. Let us reconvene. We don't have many talks left out because we have been working quite extensively in the previous part of the day. So, Julia, uh, the microphone is yours. At the moment, we have an online presentation by Volkov Kursi. Uh, maximum aerobic um, capacity uh, during the step-by-step -step testing. Vasily, we can see you very well. So we're listening to you. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Dear panel members, um, good afternoon. Please allow me to speak on the maximum aerobic capacity and the uh, speed of uh, exertion growth in the step-by-step -step testing. So Vasily Volkov is the author, alongside with uh, Rita Tambovtseva from the uh, original University of Physical Culture. For the athletes and for coaches, people working in the functional diagnostic, in the area of functional diagnostics, we know that the maximum diagnost uh, maximum capacity of oxygen is um, uh, one of the markers of resilience. Also, it's a good predictor in the clinic of a clinical situation and evaluation of quality of life. Apart from maximum capacity of oxygen and its informative value. Also, there is an informative value of the so-called maximum aerobic capacity. That means this is uh, something that can be uh, done by a subject before this parameter in the English literature is maximum capacity. We call it maximum aerobic capacity because we have the maximum anaerobic capacity as another parameter. Thus, the author uh, created a target of a study to uh, study a maximum aerobic capacity and the growth of aerobic uh, load in high uh, qualified fighters. So, So different laboratories test by different equipment and with the use of different velocities of uh, exertion. Okay. So logically, they, they run into problems with interpretation and comparing data dynamically. For example, if the uh, subject is tested in different laboratories, we decided to understand how different protocols are interweaved and interrelated, taking different types, five uh, different types of series of step-by-step -step testing. High qualified sport uh, athletes are the subjects, the ones who deal with the national and world leagues. So the subjects came over to the laboratory only two times and within two times, they needed to perform the tests and receive uh, the reference to other testing procedures and to do different steps. Just once again, I'd like to remind you that these are step-by-step -step testing. So this is the step where we assess physiological reaction to the stress. It uh, lasted for a different period of time. You can see right here the time periods that we assessed. We took two classical durations or intervals. Um, so four and two minutes, three, five minutes are recommended by the classical books on sports medicine. But we actually need to have some steady state uh, load because there is a lag period 
in the cardiovascular system. And uh, because of the contemporary equipment, we have shorter steps nowadays, two, three minutes at the moment are tested according to the literature sources. Then there are other protocols reflecting our hypothesis. We decided to take 15, 30, 60. Uh, so the step was pretty much the same, 30 uh, VT. We always started with the same 60 bat per girls and boys, and then 80 uh, rotations per minute. That was the pedals. That was the ergometer, contemporary one, with quite good uh, capacity for experiments. These are the outcomes. Here we have two major parameters of interest to us. The first one is it's the time of test, how much was needed. And the main thing is the maximum capacity of uh, rejection when uh, the subject finished himself or he could not sustain this uh, frequency of pedaling. So he decided he uh, needed to bring it down by 10 or 20. The maximum aerobic capacity is uh, back proportional to the duration of protocol. You can see on average 350 watts for 15 second step and 214 watts on average for the longest four minutes step. We should say that between the steps, there was uh, significance at the level of trends. All the others, uh, all the other protocols were significantly different between one another. If you look at the time, you can see almost eightfold uh, economy of time if you compare the longest and the shortest protocols. Thus, we can come to the conclusion the use of uh, exertion of 15, 30, 60, or 120 seconds with the growth of 30 watts mm, statistic, uh, gave us statistically significant difference in high qualified fighters. From the uh, viewpoint of practical in implication, first of all, we need to revise or describe once again the maximum aerobic uh, capacity, which uh, is achieved in the uh, test of uh, escalating uh, exercise, whether it is dynamic or whether it depends on what protocol the specialist uses and when a, a, an athlete just uh, has low motivation to continue pedaling. Because we use also the so uh, to say capacity zones, especially in cycling type of uh, sports activity. So when we speak about percentage from the maximum aerobic capacity, there can be incompatibility, especially when the athlete comes to think that he's in the transit zone, but as a matter of fact, he's already oxygenated. And the third aspect, we need to recalculate the correlations. If at the moment the literature sources show the maximum aerobic capacity, um, two, three minutes in classical protocols is much better in terms of uh, prognostic value than MPK, then we need to recalculate all the correlations with shorter protocols. And if indeed, they, can't, they uh, come to be the same, they have good prognostic value, I mean, then eightfold economy of the time will be something very, very glorious for the athletes, as well as the diagn diagnostic uh, specialist. Because, for example, testing the whole uh, team in hockey or football with all the equipment will require several days and several days will uh, be needed uh, for the visual interpretation of the results. More to that, long exertion, I mean longer steps, are related also to negative impact on the athletes, which can impact the well-being on the same day or on the next day. And we, being diagnosed, sort of intervene into the uh, training process. These are the intermediate results. The experiment is ongoing. Uh, we continue collecting data for the physical parameters, but this is beyond my presentation today. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Now the next presentation. If you have questions, I will be uh, happy to take them. Well, all the questions come after, if there are questions. And now we invite uh, Yelena Aleni, who will talk about the differences of uh, gender somatotypes in uh, strength sports patients, subjects. Now we're going to continue with trends. Uh, to have more people from different genders in powerlifting. Uh, there are many more women nowadays who do this type of sport and uh, on the, the impact of training, there is somatic changes in the, in the women. We have active uh, so we have active uh, women in the strength sports, the medical and biological processes that happen during the period of adapting to such type of sports result in a different somatic and gender differentiation. We needed to detect gender somatotypes in, uh, in subjects uh, based upon their morphological indexes. indices. We, uh, considered subjects of the age, of the mean age of 22, candidates and masters of sports with the experience between five to 10 years. As statistics shows, this age is most active for uh, endurance sports. Some of the typing, and as well as the uh, gender demarcation was done by Tanner and Marshall methods with three gender types, mesomorphic as uh, intermediary, uh, genicomorphic and andromorphic. One of the uh, indicator, indicators is the form of uh, pelvis, shoulder size, as well as their proportional ratio. All these morphological uh, signs were typical of the somatotypes. We received the following results anthropometry in uh, this type of athletes are shown on the slide. You can see the BMI, you can see masculine index, as well as the gender dimorphism. Um, as a matter of fact, the type of figure it was uh, herpes, uh, bottom down, which is also demonstrated by uh, the pelvis to shoulder ratio. Most of the uh, subjects reported normal weight according to their own uh, assessment. The mean indicator for Russia uh, is shown on the slide. Now, by some regions, you can see this is Moscow, Ingushetia, and the mean uh, value for the population. As this, uh, this table shows here, uh, overlap with the norm, uh, which shows you hyperandogenia and also uh, morphological changes within the, the body system. The gender types ratio shows that gynecomorphic somatotype was not determined by any of the subjects. Mesomorphic was determined in 26% with the smallest experience and lowest qualification, but 74% longer dealing with powerlifting determined pathological inversive andromorphic somatotype. The uh, results of this study allows us to come to the conclusion that According to the experience and intense intensity of you know, physical exercise, there is a somatic shift with the formation of non-physiological gender uh, somatotypes, mesomorphic and andromorphic. The pelvic to, pelvis to shoulder ratio also shows muscularization of athletes. 
I should say that the prospects of this study are very important because we need to study masculinization in the gender somatotypes in younger athletes dealing with powerlifting, in the endurance sports, strength sports, and definitely we need to know more about their morphology. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now we're going to listen from Irina Krasnarodska, who will talk about the chest gut and infrasound. So we're going to uh, speak about uh, chest duck and the, uh, under the impact of infrasound. So the uh, impact of industry and the heterogenic impacts need to be studied, studied, especially if we speak about the industrial noises and transportation noises. Uh, the, one of the components of that is infrasound which can result in the problems with the vascular walls, the vascular wall impairment, uh, and the also the thin uh, lymph nodes can be impaired, which can uh, result in uh, problems with the lymph ducts. The most topical is, of course, the study of the uh, lymph vessels in uh, athletes because there is an impact of not only infrasound and other um, technogenic uh, factors of the environment, but it is added up by the ever uh, increasing physical exercise, which can result in the impairment of normal function of the lymphatic uh, orifice or lymphatic ducts. The biggest collector of the lymph in all the mammals is the chest uh, lymph duct, which starts at the uh, uh, 12th uh, lumbar uh, vertebra, and uh, further it goes to the chest, which uh, and it lies posterior the uh, thoracic aorta, and then it goes into the left venous uh, angle. Then uh, it can be traced to the neck, and uh, there are other collectors that add up. Uh, this is the uh, mediastrinal left duct, the left uh, clavicular, as well as the jugular. This uh, bronchomediastrinal collects the lymph from the left part of the chest, and the clavicular from the uh, upper left part of the chest and also the jugular one, it's uh, the head and uh, the left part of the neck. So this uh, chest duct is the main collector of the lymph uh, because uh, three quarters of our body uh, would be drained by it. And it has the thickest wall. We needed to study the, uh, first of all, the um, anatomy and uh, the uh, effect of the infrasound over it. We uh, did uh, this um, with 30 uh, Degu uh, rodents, which are most um, athletic of all the rodents, and uh, uh, they're very um, agile, just like our athletes. They were placed in the infrasound uh, uh, chamber, and they were subject to the infrasound within three uh, hours daily, of four, six weeks. The infrasound with the intensity of 100 uh, decibels and frequency of 16 hertz. At the end of each week, uh, part of the animals were uh, withdrawn from the experiment and their organs were uh, withdrawn for uh, further analysis. And uh, they were uh, just compared to the control organs. Histology was done control of the uh, duct itself, as well as the micro microscopy with the standard stainings. Results demonstrated that within first two weeks, there is dilatation of the duct 
all the compartments are delocated, but the maximum it can be uh, observed within the valvular uh, valves, and uh, you can see that the shape of the duct is uh, uh, still there, but the counters, so to say, of the duct are somewhat defaced. Also, the myosites uh, within the wall are reduced. In the area of the muscular calf, the myosites are still there, but in the inner layer of the, of the calf, they are decomposed uh, for uh, groups of uh, separate uh, separate groups of fibrum. Within the first week after the infrasound exposure, the, these myocytes are not very significant, but by the set, by the end of the second week, you can see the reduction of these myocytes by 10 to 20 or to 12 percent compared to the control group. More to that, in the area of the valves, you can see that the myocytes are uh, reoriented from the circular direction, they change the direction and they become also circular, sometimes even uh, or still uh, oblong, which can be observed at week two. Also, the myocytes are reduced in the area of the muscular calf. This is the uh, middle part, but only in the internal layer and mainly it can be observed uh, because of the muscular bundles are decomposed uh, and they become separate, uh, just fiber. The infrasound also is characterized with the uh, impaired uh, structure of the cell. Some of the structure is impaired. After the first week, you can see myocytes with the market dilatation of infraplasmotic uh, net. The number of ribosomes is reduced. The mitochondria are bulging and the crests are they are not parallel sometimes they're even ruptured the cytoplasm is uh, uh, more transparent and uh, because of smaller number of, of freely ribosomes at week two these changes are even uh, worse degeneration uh, uh, becomes more marked and the plasmatic ne uh, net is ruptured and the mitochondrion is bulging, the crests are ruptured, disoriented in different directions. There are the cytoplasm is even more transparent, translucent, because the free ribosomes are even fewer. And there are vacuoles that you can observe as a result. This data shows damage of the cellular structure, which cause about the parish of myocytes in the long run. At week three, after such impact, you can observe a narrowing of the duct, uh, quite significant, by 40% if compared to the data of the control group. When this narrowing happens, the chest duct is still the same shape. But between the myocytes, the level of this valvular um, valves, uh, seems to be a bit wider than in the control group. That's why the shape sometimes uh, is uh, somewhat smoothened. By week four, these processes are even more, uh, even more marked and. Uh, they achieve approximately 18, 20%. More to that, the myocytes uh, change orientation from the circular located ones in the area of the valves. The myocytes show themselves as separate fibra. Uh, they're either oblique or even transverse, but in the area, in the uh, lymphangions, in the muscular calves area, there is complete disorientation of the muscular bundles and myocytes within them, instead of circular position, uh, shift into the oblique position, sometimes even oblique and transverse, especially in the internal layer when the muscular bundles by this time are almost decomposed completely. And the myocytes are separate disaggregated cells. By week four, this narrowing of the duct uh, changes into dilatation again, which is uneven, not homogeneous. Not all myocytes uh, are dilatated. Some of them are of normal size or uh, normal shape. 
the contents are quite clear. Despite the fact that there is certain dilatation in the area of the muscular cuffs, but the contents are smooth. <clears throat> At this time, the uh, amount of myocytes, the number of myocytes is reduced and reduced by 10% if compared to the previous period of. Uh, research of the previous uh, period, three weeks, I mean. Weeks five and uh, six, there is market dilatation of the uh, chest duct, and uh, in the middle portion, it is dilatated by 120% even. In the area of the valves, in the area of the valves, there is still market dilatation, but the, the pangeons become shorter. Their widths and lengths become uh, even and uh, they become roundish and the whole uh, duct becomes, so to say, roundish, like beady shape. The, the amount of myocytes uh, becomes smaller and by the end of six weeks, the number of myocytes within the wall is accounts for accounts for fifty percent from the control data. And the orientation really suffers. You can see that the my sides they are oblique and transverse. In the valvular area, there are disintegrated separate cells, transversely orientated. In the calf area, there are myocytes in the outer layer that also do not uh, that do not shape any um, muscular bundles. <clears throat> in the internal layer, they are chaotically organized and they are isolated by day by week five and six, you can see this process is ongoing and the collagen uh, car case also changes. The, this uh, collagen fiber are uh, disintegrated and the, the meandering nature is still there. It is still intact, but at week five, they become straight and they are uh, decompose into separate bundles or separate fiber even. They change their orientation. They become oblique. And they start later on strengthening along the vertical axis of the vessel. So from one calf, from one muscular calf to another, thus they have transverse orientation in the area of lymphangeal. Thanks to this process and thanks to smoothening these uh, curves, elasticity changes and they lose their capacity to uh, be flexible. I must apologize, I'm out of the time frames. So when it comes to the elastic fiber, elastic fiber, uh, they form a mesh in the norm but it becomes completely disintegrated and falls into separate uh, dorsal fiber, chaotically placed, which do not perform the elastic regulation function any longer. This changes that happen in the limbs that result in the following collectors and other lymph uh, system organs stop functioning, the valves stop directing the lymph and uh, regulating it, So, which can result in significant, uh, sig significant problems. So I will not Tell you the conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.
next presentation by Igor Yerkushev. Uh, he will speak about uh, prevention of uh, rhinitis in uh, swimmers. So, dear speakers, please uh, uh, watch the uh, time constraints. So, good day, dear colleagues. My talk is going to be very short. First thing I want to mention that uh, finally we reached uh, issues on the prevention. So, as in real life, prevention uh, takes uh, the uh, 22nd place. And uh, if uh, the prevention is practiced, the Maybe even sportsmen will have no pathologists. And even committee of sports didn't say anything about the prevention of diseases in sportsmen, which actually reflects real life. Prevention uh, is considered uh, something, so to say, forgotten and not and non important. And another thing I was really interested to, uh, was in the previous talk. No, it's not quite clear why 16 hertz were taken. It was almost on the border with the regular sound. It's well, very well known fact. Academician Schleichen mentioned it. He discovered so called C voice, which we see with a shift of the uh, world corner and appearance of tsunami. The uh, sound of 6 to 8 hertz is considered, is considered to be the most dangerous. So maybe we should do similar studies, but but take the frequency of six to eight hertz. But the uh, uh, actual study material, study data is very interesting, and, and if it's possible, I would like to use it in my lecture. What I'm telling them about Maria Celeste and flying Dutch, but here it's going to be uh, it's going to be uh, real life data, so to say. Uh, then uh, about our study, I would like to present. A very short piece of our studies. The studies are ongoing. Uh, they uh, entered, uh, I might say, their final stage. So we present here, as I said, only a small piece of these uh, studies. As to the relevance, I make switch slides, I suppose. Uh, excuse me for that. So in our department, what we see is a uh, master thesis uh, studies, and we should like to introduce it. Uh, it it's a very relevant study. Professional swimmers, as we say, they uh, suffer at, uh, during the uh, training so, or even contests. They develop uh, pathologies led to the uh, reaction of upper respiratory tract, muco tract mucosa. We analyzed dozens of works, first of all, medical works, where specialists and sports physicians mentioned it as one of the most important and relevant pathologies for professional swimmers. We uh, discussed it with ET Institute specialists, developed a program and uh, agreed on uh, many aspects and diagnostic capabilities. And we developed combined measures which could be applied to help uh, to professional swimmers uh, for uh, high degrees. We discussed with them a set of interventions uh, from the point of view of maximum availability and uh, uh, simplicity to use, not searching for some unique technologies or, or health saving technologies. So, the ENT Institute recommended to do the study with use of ectaine, aquamaris ectaine. It is uh, nasal drops which uh, are not uh, banned by the anti-doping legislation and they work quite well then out of existing means we used uh, 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 the allergo fit tea it showed it uh, showed quite good results when we studied uh, allergies in uh, among gymnasts results were 
quite promising. And so we tried to develop technologies of bracing gymnastics, which uh, or bracing exercises, which sportsmen can also use on a permanent basis. So we developed a special program. On the first stage, uh, ENT specialist did the uh, diagnosis of uh, sportsmen, found uh, they picked uh, a group of lists uh, with some uh, uh, or with some uh, lesions, uh, they found a group of. They also found uh, persons requiring surgery, but they, they were not included. Uh, then we selected uh, uh, professional sportsmen. Uh, we divided them into two arms: uh, experimental and control one. And uh, so, uh, experimental group all used all those interventions. And the most important requirement was to use the top category water, bottled water. Uh, we checked the market in St. Petersburg. Uh, so we did such a marketing study and we found uh, several samples of bottled water, which to some extent uh, could be considered uh, as the water of top uh, category. So the results showed that we detected so that's uh, uh, that's a table we selected but uh, we decided to show this table it shows that uh, there is a three months of that approach stange test uh, the time of those uh, physical tests we see in the experimental group, we found uh, positive statistical changes. And that's why, based on our studies, we uh, found out that some of the sportsmen in two weeks, they developed positive changes. And by the end, three months, almost all uh, sportsmen were treated. Uh, of the rhinitis, it's very simple and effective technique. Could be it could be uh, called as a health retaining technology, which could be used in real life, and not uh, and not only uh, with the swimmers, not only by the swimmers. Thank you. Alessandro Veronica. A uh, vertebra column uh, uh, condition in young sportsmen. Good dear colleagues, it's a piece of a study. We, for well, several years already, we studied the locomotive system performance and we, we've concentrated on two criteria. It's a condition of uh, uh, spine and uh, uh, and uh, feet. Uh, why we took young sportsmen? We took sp uh, young, uh, young age uh, sportsmen because we, found, we wanted to find some correlations between sportsmen and non sportsmen. Uh, and uh, those who we started to wear uh, hockey players, fo football players, rugby, and wrestlers. Uh, we started them as a period of initial training so we could compare them with. Uh, junior age or primary school age, it's, uh, it's 10 to 11 uh, years old. And uh, their coaches actually gave us some back, uh, feedback. The children complained of uh, some tinnitus, uh, headaches, and other issues. And they, st and they asked maybe there are some, uh, maybe there is some causes of that. So it was a combined trial. I, we are presenting all the piece of them. It was a field test, like Adam's test, we did analysis of walking and uh, sitting down, forest test, and three test, test, and plantography. But talking about the uh, spine, it's Adam's test and uh, 3D scan. We assessed uh, scholotic uh, uh, problems. Uh, 
and our 3D scan could uh, show could show uh, frontal uh, plane angles, but we use such an approach. So what we found out, you can see here that the age nine to eleven, nine and ten years. So these are athletes. This is the issues which we found. First of all, it was a neck area and lumbar area. Yes, indeed, there was pain, uh, and we had it as a feedback. It was tested on uh, primary school children. It, it's a clear correlation, there's a clear trend. And the problem of the neck uh, cervical spine is uh, it's, uh, all the same. And we uh, we started to talk about that as a post-pandemic syndrome. It is uh, like, it's, uh, it was like the fall syndrome or screen syndrome, but it was discovered in the 20th century. It is, uh, but it is actually, the syndrome uh, uh, actually uh, it could be considered as an overlap syndrome. Uh, so, when using gadgets, the children they have a phone or a device, they sit in such a position. Uh, and when we started to do such studies and tried to uh, follow it up. This uh, screen syndrome was detected in 90% of kids and young, both young sportsmen and those not practicing sports of uh, uh, primary uh, school age. What else we found? Of course, it was uh, problems uh, with the uh, lumbar area. It's an area uh, sufficient with the overlapping syndrome affected uh, muscles uh, surrounding the lumbar uh, area. And uh, we uh, now we developed very simple recommendations. Not not all coaches actually accepted it. Also, children whom we saw, uh, who we met, there are some small sets of uh, exercises which ask them to to include in the preliminary uh, part of the uh, training sessions. So we need repeated testing, but we don't have numbers. But the feedback. Uh, about such symptoms as headache or dizziness, they actually is a less in tests, meaning it means less of complaints. I don't know if we can say about even small success, but let's hope that we uh, uh, that it was our contribution to make our children and young athletes healthier. So these are the uh, uh, numbers. Well, talking about the three D scanning. And sclerotic changes uh, of normalities. The story was as follows 90% there were found some sclerotic uh, lesions, and those uh, sclerotic abnormalities in children of 9 to 10 years old are typical for the sclerosis stage 2. And since we work with that and try to find any, any correlation with the uh, feet, Changes of the joints and lig ligaments in, in feet. It was the same story. If there's any scoliosis, it means that there's a high probability those uh, children might uh, have any changes, pathology changes with their feet. That's what I want to tell, uh, tell you about. It's very brief. So if you have any questions, I would be uh, glad to answer them. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And continue this topic. It is a presentation by Ludmila Miller, prevention of uh, chronic overtension of locomotor system in students of uh, choreography school of St. Petersburg. The audience, the panel members, can I have my slides on, please? This is kind of choreography, please. 
by the surname of Lima. Yes, I will check it. Just give me a second. Vladimir, are you ready? Okay, we have some technical thing done. Uh-huh, okay. So now the presentation will come from Vladimir Gorofiko. He will speak about the experience of antidoting um, a training in the Leskovtsa University of uh, Sports and Physical Culture. My esteemed colleagues, please allow me to share our experience with you, experience of training specialist on anti-doping provision in uh, our university named after Piotr Lisbon. Uh, Indeed, training of such specialists is a separate issue because nowhere in the world we have such separately trained specialists. And I should like to start with a couple of words about doping as such, because we do understand very well that doping as a problem did not occur yesterday. It occurred much earlier. You can see this beautiful figure where an Olympic champion, Thomas Hicks, is being just um, transported somewhere by his hands because he's completely uh, exhausted. He fell several times and they gave him shots of strychnine. You can see the formula. This is a rat poison. And only thanks to this, he managed to run to the end and uh, get his golden Olympic medal. All the other athletes were very unpleased with that. And the uh, world... Federation of uh, Track and Field uh, banned any shots after that. Well, you can ban what not, but how to control it. I would like once again to remind you that at our university, there was a professor who worked alongside with Peter Lesgaft. His name was Mikhail uh, Tsviet, who prepared uh, or who devised the method of chromatography. Unfortunately, he was not awarded the Nobel Prize for the development of this method because in uh, 1919, he unfortunately starved to death under Varonish. So, but he's a priority. He's um, uh, a known person all over the world. You can see this mass spectrometry and chromatography, which is used up to now in the doping control system. When we speak about doping, we should say that just slogans, let's ban it all, it won't, it won't just do. That's why the doping control procedures were first implemented in 1972 in Munich. Of course, we do remember this Olympic uh, Games, not only uh, because of uh, this, but because of the Israel uh, athletes who died. Uh, during these Olympic Games, you can see the first Olympic Games dating back to 1972 when it first happened. Since then, it is both, it underwent a great path. You uh, know this person, this is the uh, head of our anti doping laboratory in Moscow. He is a notorious person. He um, actually created an anabolic steroid cocktail alongside with Martini which allowed uh, uh, it to uh, hide it in the blood of the athlete. But he is also notorious for the long-term metabolites, um, metabolites of the uh, steroids. And thanks to this, I mean, not a single sportsman uh, or athlete can be sure that within half a year, uh, actually, um, doping will not be detected in his blood uh, after it was, in half a year time after it was uh, applied. And uh, this is a laboratory which is closed. 
and all our tests at the moment are done in our friends in Turkey, in Ankara, in the anti-doping laboratory. We don't have a Bashar laboratory at the moment. When we speak about the fact that we need specialists in this area all over the world, in the area of anti-doping provision, we should say that there is a separate uh, area. Um, we have the Ministry of Labor degrees and orders, and we, for the first time, started training bachelors in this area. Uh, we have trained two uh, set of graduates already. You can see the universal competences, which are typical of this graduate. You can see the universal competences. They're available in our website of our rest of the university, what they can do, what they cannot. These are the main competences, uh, something we teach them. And I suppose that it is really very important. The problem is there. There is a problem with uh, landing jobs because especially with the anti-doping, these are people who are very responsible. As a matter of fact, they're either volunteers or they're part-time workers, and that's why it sets about other problems. You can see what disciplines have been created in our university starting from 2017. We have additional ones created, and the main aspects, the main aspects of our curriculum, are first, first here. More to that, we need practically oriented approach, and that's why we have hands-on practices organized for our students. Many of them are quite serious issues. They need to be studied in depth. You remember that not very long ago we have had this COVID-19 pandemic and of course it was very difficult to organize hands-on during that pandemic times. But today uh, uh, in the frameworks of our cooperation with the uh, sports um, community and tourist community of uh, city government, we managed to organize all this. And of course, scientific research. We are quite active in involving them in different sorts of research and anti-doping. We have achievements. We have good cooperation with the National Olympic Committee at the moment. And you can see the research bachelor's uh, thesis that were defended by our um, students last year. We shall continue with that. If we speak about the contemporary condition of the problem. I would like to draw your attention to the following. First of all, uh, we should uh, think back to the last summit of the Antidote Committee. One of the Olympic champions, the president of this committee, said that we need to deepen, strengthen, and expand our approaches to antidote. Uh, testing, like uh, testing, for example, the equipment like uh, smartphones, notebooks, iPads of the athletes. At the moment, it is criticized, but it is discussed at the same time in the uh, mass media. It is covered very widely in the mass media, but I suppose that's what we shall uh, result in. In conclusion, I would like to say that indeed, the fact that we don't have an anti-doping laboratory is a big problem. This is a problem that should be resolved. I would like to invite all of you to the first All Russia conference, which will be organized in the rest of May, June. This is called White Nights of St. Petersburg for Healthy and Honest Sport. This information is also available on the website of our university. We cordially invite you to come there. We shall also have the altars of our students' research works. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Ludmila is back to the microphone. Ludmila. Final uh, presentation for today. We hope that this technical hinder has been corrected. Okay, now we are going to speak about the prevention of chronic problems with the uh, locomotion, locomotive um, system in um, 
dancers and students of the choreography school, named after Agrippina Vaganova, an institution of, uh, named after Dreden, and also a national university of physical culture and sports named after Lesta. But this is our cooperation school. Now, why is it so topical to speak about it? The most frequent problem uh, with future dancers is chronic over uh, exhaustion of the locomotion system, which uh, doesn't allow them to perform for quite a long period of time. At the moment, it is absolutely mandatory to develop such prevention methods of chronic uh, over exhaustion, over uh, exertion of this um, the system, and effective of this prevention will prolong their life on stage. So the target and the aim of this research is to um, assess the condition of locomotion system in uh, uh, future dances, uh, detect the types of exertion in um, ballet schools and choreography schools in the city, as well as develop a physical exercise um, set for locomotive system uh, for the initial part of uh, tuition which will allow us to do uh, effective prevention. Methods are questioning, pedagogical follow-up, observation, um, examination by the author, um, author petition, uh, which was done by Elena Shepkina, Doctor of Medical Sciences, and consultation of a traumatologist and other petition, and also um, pedagogical experiment, organization of this uh, research. It was conducted in the um, Ballet Academy, now named after Vaganova, from January to May 2022, there were 38 subjects enrolled uh, in the age group between 10 to 12. So this, these are just primary classes. Uh, the uh, volume of their um, the low, you know, the number of our hours uh, taught, you know, I mean, of classical choreography is 20 academic hours uh, per week. Uh, they were all. Um, divided into two groups with experiment, the experimental one and the control. Um, so two, three times per week, 45 uh, minutes, within 1.5 months, they were provided such uh, exercises. Uh, this is quite short period of time. We are going to continue with that. And later on, most probably, we shall uh, get more statistically significant data. The control group in, uh, uh, had 19. Uh, students all in all, and they didn't have any prevent uh, prevention exercises. So first of all, we conducted, uh, we uh, detected the problems within uh, locomotion, uh, locomotive system. This is first of all insufficient or ineffective warm, warm up, uh, ineffective uh, techniques of dancing, then irrational uh, load to physical exertion, and uh, also we detected the following problems with the chronic exertion of the locomotive uh, system uh, by the methods of photography and clinical manifestations photogram of the norm uh, with the external uh, flat, um, um, flat foot and hollow foot with the load over the external compartment. So the last one is already clinical signs of flat foot. So this complex was uh, also included in the preventive, preventive exercises. It was done uh, three times per week, uh, three, for 30, 30 times for 30 seconds uh, gap. There was a uh, warm up and then uh, walking on the stick, as well as uh, working with a ball, as well as stretching different type of um, we provided them with additional uh, recommendations to balance, to stand on one foot, on two feet. You can see the uh, you can see the pictures that demonstrate this type of uh, preventative gymnastics. As a result, you can see this experimental group showed. Uh, positive dynamics. There is just a trend towards something positive. Uh, so 
there is some trend towards positive dynamics. This is quite a small period of time, a uh, month and a half. So talking about correction at the moment is uh, way too early. In conclusion, I would like to say that the complex of physical exercises can be used in any choreography school in order to prevent chronic um, problems with the locomotive systems in dancers and other types of athletes. Thank you very much. There are three online presentations. The first one comes from Wang Chen Chen, uh, impact of different methods of uh, restoration in um, uh, acute pro problems with the back and uh, waist. We come from Tianjin University of Sports in China. And uh, the second author of this article, the title of this article is Effect of Different Methods on Recovery of Acute Lumbar and Back Fatigue. I will introduce my article in four parts. Firstly, let me introduce the research background. China is curiously advancing on the path of building a world sports powerhouse, and there are more and more college students who enjoy physical fitness. However, the muscle fatigue caused by fitness is often overlooked, and the rapid fatigue is not fully alleviated, leading to fatigue accumulation and easy to cause sports injuries. The uh, title of this article is the effect of different methods on recovery of that is, actual lumbar and the back fatigue. When exercise fatigue occurs, the muscle's ability to withstand external loads decreases, and exercise performance also decreases accordingly. As, as China moves time, forward accompanied in building by a world sporting powerhouse, the number of there university is students who enjoy strengthening their bodies is increasing. And the soft However, the muscle fatigue because, that occurs after a workout is often the overlooked in the assimilation the of, of fatigue, fatigue that is now Some fully been relieved in their research time and time again, relaxation training which can easily lead to sports, sports fatigue injury. that relaxation training is a way of relaxing the organism from a tensile state. Relaxation has two meanings. One is muscle relaxation, and the other is to eliminate the tension. Relaxation training is one of the important measures to promote oscillator recovery. The specific way to eliminate fatigue can be achieved through multiple passive or acute. Active methods, regarding such as the intervention methods for the recovery of uh, sports fatigue, some scholars have shown in their research on physical relaxation training and the recovery of sports fatigue that uh, relaxation training is a way of uh, relaxing the organism from a tense state. Relaxation has two minutes. One is muscle relaxation and the other is to eliminate eliminate tension. Relaxation training is one of the most one of the important methods to promote athletic recovery. The specific way to eliminate to eliminate uh, fatigue can be achieved through multiple passive or active methods, such as uh, massage, stretching, breathing, self-rest, and so on. The direct purpose of eliminating fatigue is to relax the muscles of the body and the ultimate goal is to restore the, ent the entire body function to the best so that the positive effects of exercise can be best reflected and the, the negative effects of uh, exercise fatigue can be reduced. Let's move forward for the next part, the research method. Supporting non-sports non major male college students from a certain university were selected as participants and divided into, into four groups. First, the heat, the, the weight, and the BMI of the subjects were measured using the Omron height and the weight tester. Then the subjects were randomly divided into four groups, with 10 people in each group, namely the stretching group, fascia gun group, exercise message group, and the uh, lab control group. Each group of uh, subjects first uh, underwent inertial 
beta measurement indicators followed by a five-minute warm-up activity with the lead subject followed by fatigue monitoring. The subject used an electronic back force tester to cool with maximum force every 10 seconds by continu continuously pulling with maximum, maximum, maximum force for at least eight times and reducing the maximum asymmetric contraction force by more than 20%, it was uh, considered to have research uh, to have reached the theoretical acute exercise fatigue. If the reduction was 20 20% 20, 20 before reaching eight times, it was uh, considered to have reached eight times. After the fatigue monitoring was completed, the indicators were immediately measured. After measurement, the four groups of subjects were re relaxed using stretching, fascia gun, exercise massage, and rest. Self-stretching group. Referring to the in referring to the literature, the the following stretching methods were selected. First one is a uh, cat stretching and uh, abdominal stretching, kneeling, kneeling back stretching, spine stre stretching of the left and the right legs, each left for two minutes for a total of 10 minutes. Exercise massage group. The subjects were placed in a prone position and used five techniques, rolling, pinching, pressing, needling, and rubbing to relax their backs. Each technique lasted for two minutes, totally 10 minutes. Fascia gun group, the subject is in a prone position and the fascia gun is used to target the patient's back muscles. First, use the U-shaped head to relax the lumbar segment for five minutes, and then use a flat head to relax both sides of the lower back for five minutes a total of 10 minutes. Next, control group. Uh, subjects in supine position take a rest for 10 minutes. Measure the indicators again and uh, record them. Immediately measure indicators after intervention. This experiment uh, conducted two measurements. Immediately after uh, fatigue and immediately after intervention. The measurement data includes the degree of self-perceived exertion, maximum asymmetric contraction of the lumbar and dorsal muscles, stress endurance of the lumbar and the dorsal muscles, and the examination of uh, abdominal curling movement patterns. Next is about the result and uh, analysis. This is a composition of data from each group after fatigue relief. There was a significant differences, difference in the stress endurance of the lumbar and dorsal muscles after fatigue relief in the fascia gun group compared to the other three groups. There was a significant difference in the maximum, maximum Asymmetric contraction force of the lumbar and dorsal muscles after fatigue relief between the fascia gun group and the self stretching group compared to the exercise massage group and the control group. There were significant differences in the data of self perceived extension and the curling movement patterns among four groups of the subjects before and after fatigue, fatigue relief. But there was but there was no significant dif difference between the control group, the fascia gun group, and the self-stretching group, and the exercise massage group using data before and after fatigue relief. Respectively, after one-way analysis of the variance. Another, uh, another ac acute uh, fatigue of the lumbar and dorsal muscles, the fascia, the fascia gun significantly improved the stress endurance and the recovery of the maximum asymmetric contraction force of the lumbar and dorsal muscles after lumbar fatigue. 
Self-searching significantly improves the recovery of maximum maximum asymmetric contraction force of the lower back muscles after lumbar fatigue. The immediate effect of uh, self-stretching exercise massage and lying down rest on the maximum asymmetric contraction and the strength endurance of the lumbar and dorsal muscles is not significant. At last, let me introduce the conclusions and uh, recommendations. First, for the relief of uh, of acute muscle fatigue, we cannot be in, in limited to traditional exercise massage. Self-stretching is a good method. As an emerging exercise rehabilitation device, the fascia gun can effectively alleviate ele people's uh, ac acute fa fatigue. People should pay enough attention to muscle fatigue as uh, accumulation of muscle Exhaustion can easily lead to further muscle pain and even damage. In our daily life, it is important to actively relieve ourselves after workout in order to prevent fatigue accumulation and uh, negative consequence. The relief of uh, acute muscle fatigue should also vary from people to people. And uh, individuals should choose the most suitable method based on their own situation. During training or competition, different relaxation methods have different efforts on the recovery of muscle condition. Strength and the subjective uh, discomfort, therefore, it is important to choose the appropriate relaxation method according to the actual situation. Thank you for listening. Next presentation, Bo Jen. In pre-diabetic um, elderly people and obesity.
certified exercise prescription specialists in China. The data collection during the trial was conducted by technical professionals who were not aware of the grouping of the participants. Inclusion criteria were as follows. Patients who were clinically diagnosed with PD and met the diagnostic criteria for OSOC Table 1. Elderly individuals aged 60 years or older women who had undergone menopause for more than one year. Willingness to voluntarily participate and promise to complete all trial requirements. And the signing of an informed consent form. This page is about the basic condition of subjects before exercise intervention. Intervention method for the treatment group. The exercise intervention consisted of aerobic and resistance training. 60 minutes per session, 3 times a week Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 90-30 to 10 and for a total of 12 weeks. Moderate intensity exercise was selected. With a target heart rate of 40% to 60% of the heart rate reserve. Prior to the intervention, each participant was provided with a polar watch, which was set to their target heart rate. If the participant exceeded the designated range, the polar watch would emit an alarm to remind them to adjust accordingly. Ratings of perceived exertion were controlled within a range of 10 to 14. The exercise consisted of a warm-up section, main body section, and a cool down section. The main body section of the exercise intervention for the treatment group included both aerobic and resistance training. This is the aerobic section. Resistance training section. The resistance training component of the exercise intervention for the treatment group involves slow to sit body weight exercises such as squats, kneeling push, up, and sit who participants were instructed to perform each movement slowly, taking at least 4 seconds to complete a full repetition. The exercise protocol included 2 sets of 10 repetitions for each exercise. Every 4 weeks, the number of repetitions was increased by 2% to gradually increase the challenge of the exercise. For the control group, participants were instructed to maintain their usual daily activities and lifestyle without any change. They were not asked to increase their physical activity level or participate in any form of exercise intervention. The study was a 14 weeks intervention, with 12 weeks allocated for implementing the exercise prescription and 2 weeks for measurement. During the intervention period, Participants were required to complete a daily physical activity diary. Follow-up assessments were conducted at 4, 8, and 12 weeks after the start of the exercise intervention to assess risk, adjust the exercise prescription, and ensure that the study was effective and free of interference to ensure compliance in the control group. The research team promised to provide the same 12 weeks exercise guides to the control participants after the completion of the study. This part is about results. Table 4 is about changes of OSO indicators before and after the intervention. These pictures facilitate us to visually see the changes of each subject. Table 5 is about changes of abdominal fat. Table 6 is about changes of blood glucose indicators. Also too, these pictures facilitate us to visually see the changes of each subject. Table 7 is about changes of blood lipid indicators. Table 8 is about changes of functional fitness. Conclusions. The 12 weeks combined aerobic and resistance exercise intervention showed promising results in inhibiting the progression of comorbidities in older adults with orthostatic hypotension and Parkinson's disease. The findings suggest that exercise interventions have great potential for optimizing body composition, improving glucose and lipid metabolism, and enhancing functional fitness in this population. These results provide evidence to guides for exercise interventions to address the challenges associated with an aging population. Thanks everyone, that's all.
Спасибо. Следующий доклад. Лиша. Связь между индексом системного иммунного воспаления и легкими когнитивными нарушениями взрослых китайцев. Напоминаю, у нас еще постерные доклады. Of my academic present presentation is association between systemic immune inflammation index and the mild community cognitive impaired impairment among Chinese adults with with the rise in the aging of the population. The number of the people over six years six years old increased repeatedly. Mind cognitive impairment, uh, as known as MCI, is uh, considered as a transition state between normal cognitive function and uh, dementia. Old people with uh, cognitive Im impairment have a short life expectancy. Aging-related cognitive decline has become a major global public health concern and uh, causes a huge economic and uh, social burden. The uh, among patients with MCI, they will progress to dementia as uh, much quickly than more than healthy people of a similar age. According to the uh, 2022 Alzheimer's disease factor and the figures who people have MCI about 25 were developed dementia after two years, and about 32% uh, of the patients with MCI developed Alzheimer's disease after five years. It is possible to prevent or deny the onset of the dementia or AD than early digno uh, diagnosis and uh, emission of MCI available Studies have not that the incidence rate of the MCI remains even this global region reached from the twenty percent to fifty percent. Inflammatory process play a complex complex real role in the disease process of the progressive cognitive decline disorders of immune and inflammatory response have been considered as an important risk part of the MCI. Many common blood parameters may be a novel inflammatory markers and may be associated with the pathogenesis or prognosis of the MCI and AD. Potenza Potenza was older Ada from the uh, China Shanghai and uh, the inclusion criteria uh, as a present. And uh, this is uh, how we diagnose MCI. We we use uh, the Chinese version of the MMS MMSE uh, Assess the cognitive impairment. And uh, uh, this is our result. Uh, uh, the pro pro in the table one, the prevalence of the MCI was 9.4% and 11.3% uh, uh, amongst men and women. In the man, the patient with MCI tend to have a low level of the uh, nutrition states, but have a high level of the depression and uh, hypertension. In women, patients with uh, MCI tend to have a low level of the nutrition states, uh, education, uh, and uh, some inflammation markers higher than the uh, control. In addition, they were more like to be windows. In the table 2, amongst women, SRI lymphocytes and the neutrophilized level was 
positively associated with the presence of MCI in the all model, but not in the man. And uh, a woman usually have a stronger immune response to stimulation than men involve different pathways and uh, immune cells, correlating to higher susceptibility to infection in male, whereas a high incidence incidence of the autoimmune disorders in female. The April RLS, which is the greatest genetic risk factor for the little onset AD, has been shown to the increase susceptibility to inflammation and the April 4 increase the risk of the AD significantly more stronger in women than in men. Uh, female sex hormones specifically estradiol and the progesterone can delay the apoptosis and the neutrophilis estrogen and the progesterone has been shown to moderate than feminine. In con conclusion, the relationship between SI and MCI was Gender dependent with MCI being significantly associated with SRR in women but not in men, which may reveal the underlying pathological mechanism by which inflammation affects uh, cognitive functions. But in the end, thank you for listening. Спасибо большое всем участникам, соучастникам, слушателям и не слушателям тоже, да, кто. Ну, дорогие мои, давайте сейчас немного. I would like to wrap up a little bit, uh, and I would like to uh, I would like to wrap up. So, if you want to ask something, you have any questions, would be great. If not, then I would like to say a couple of words. If I may, well, first of all, the first talk, of course, uh, goes to some uh, issues about uh, uh, about wrestlers, uh, uh, about wrestlers, uh, and about uh, uh, exercises. You know, uh, there are some uh, single point, a uh, single point test with some maximum, some maximum load. Uh, then uh, all standard tests for cardio systems when assessing uh, 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 health, they have a standard grade of or step of two minutes, one hundred twenty seconds, which was mentioned already. So maybe the study to understand how uh, what to do to faster work with the whole team. Of course, it makes sense. If you have 20 healthy uh, athletes, it makes sense. But it depends, of course, on experience of the uh, researcher. Because you can make a short test to have an objective data. And uh, moreover, if you use if you try to find some, uh, if you want to make some conclusions with uh, wrestlers, we need, to, we, we need to know what they, uh, what you want to have, the aerobic uh, uh, work or something. Of course, it would be interesting to discuss this issue. I regretful with these guys were uh, the remote session. And uh, so in the wrestlers, uh, it's three minutes. Uh, or 240 minutes. It's a question if we should do such a long, uh, such a long uh, step. Uh, there are lots of questions because for wrestlers, maybe, uh, maybe uh, durability is an issue for them. Well, talking about the infrasound, it is actually from the point of uh, ecology. It's ecological factor for sure, which affects humanity. If you look uh, in the Ren TV Russian channel, they show that everything affects us negatively. Uh, so 
maybe maybe uh, uh, there is some destruction, destructive effects. But when I was a young researcher, people told me that you shouldn't uh, transfer the results from animal studies to uh, humans. And it was understanding that if something happens to a rodent, uh, it's, uh, it's not obligated as it would be the same with a man. So the Western uh, science, they do studies on tissues, human tissues. I don't think it's related to some uh, animal protection activity, but if you'd like to show how myocytes die, maybe you can take a uh, myocyte culture and to study how this culture would develop uh, under the uh, infrasound, uh, under the uh, treated with infrasound. I don't know. So you, you sound so nicely. It is uh, it's a nice to see you. So the whole responsibility is on me. It is my private opinion. You know, for uh, after years of uh, being a researcher. And the one more thing, I'm not quite sure. The clean water. Uh, can I have a consultation privately? Which water in our city could be said as uh, clear? You can tell me later. Otherwise, it would be advertising. Where, at which uh, lake, at which uh, bottle we can find the clear water? Please tell me. It's, it's, it is really interesting to find out such water. Because even if uh, you look at the, another, at one more TV channel, they talk about uh, micro plastic microgranules, micro seeds, because every, in, in every polyethylene bottle, as uh, some plastic uh, microparticles. Then when we talk about the uh, spine, I thought, uh, well, you know, uh, spine, spine is a multifunctional uh, uh, thing. And uh, Vladimir, a stromatologist, might say what questions he's got related to the study, but I have only one question. Can you use static myography to study uh, uh, vertebral column? No? Oh, well, we will tell you how to do it later on. Because, uh, you know, it is a quite a frequent method uh, of uh, investigation, especially in uh, Western countries. When they study paravertebral muscles in rest, you can look in standing position and sitting position. In standing position and sitting position, you can immediately compare how the uh, lower part of the body affects uh, a vertebral column, considering all myofascial links. And we can, it could be a very uh, valuable addition to this work. Only optic topography is not enough. I understand that uh, maybe two weeks ago, I was said that optic topography is going to be a part of a standard uh, pediatric uh, evaluation. I don't know. Not into the mic. The comment is not into the mic. Well, it's just an opinion, of course. I do agree with you. We do exchange opinions here. You know, living in the northwest of Russia and having a kid without dysplasia, it is, uh, you're just quite lucky. Because all of the citizens here, they have dysplasia uh, to some extent. When I was young, when uh, there was a professor, Boris Rachkov, he was a director of the, of the Polenov Neurosurgery Institute. And he said, okay, children from the siege Leningrad, it's one thing. But what will happen to the children of children uh, or, or, or who survived the siege? It's very hard to forecast what would be the uh, lesions, what would be the issues with locomotor systems. There are lots of questions with that regard. I don't think the children will suffer of some uh, metabolic issues. It's hyperdynamia, which affects them mostly. It's hard to see uh, children playing any of things, like football or hockey, or just hide and seek in the streets. They sit somewhere with gadgets. Uh, they have uh, uh, remote friends only uh, because uh, you could uh, previously run around 
uh, with friends. But they mostly are like pen pals. It says that you, you've got to talk when you uh, when you communicate via the uh, via the social media. So the issues with locomotive system, of course, it happens, but we have lots of additional factors which uh, link us to the place we were born. Anti-doping. It's, uh, you know, it's an issue which we uh, didn't pay that much attention to when preparing a special on anti-doping. On one uh, thing, it's a very complex thing because it's very hard to understand the mechanism. It can be uh, implemented because, uh, because there are lots of things which haven't been discussed even from the legal point of view. But uh, that we uh, produce specialists, it's a big step uh, forward. Because anti-doping, it's, uh, it's an issue which was always impo of importance. People wanted to feel uh, much better uh, themselves. And all issues uh, for uh, enhancement of our daily activity, they have even military value. And we're always uh, going to fight it. Uh, and uh, when giving a lecture to students about anti-doping, I'm telling them about this uh, big sportsmen and the champions who are, regretfully, uh, who are actually sick from the very beginning. So thus, they could be given some drugs. And thus, it means the whole set of uh, pharmacotherapy. The paradox is, that though we use those classifications of disease, international disease classifications, uh, the common ones, the, but the, the way they are treated in the West, uh, we do not we treat our uh, patients differently. Like uh, the very no HD, uh, ADHD syndrome, which is where they permit to use mild narcotics to treat it. In our country, it, it is completely prohibited. We have an absolutely different approach, but there they have uh, uh, champions uh, with a the disease. Then they say that they got uh, treated, but you know, it's ADHD, ADHD is a chronic disease which is incurable. And, uh, so there are lots of nuances with anti doping. We need to, we need to study it. So uh, some all education is not enough. We need some enthusiasts who would study it furiously. Otherwise, uh, you cannot push uh, that uh, from the, so to say, from being a dead weight. And of course, uh, prevention. Prevention in sports, as with any physical exercise, it should be not passive one. Not as words, just use tapes uh, to prevent something, uh, use some uh, ointment or something. The prevention should be active, first of all. And foremost, and there was a talk. I didn't stress upon that. As the talk went uh, with the head turning to the left and to the right, there was a different uh, uh, response from the stimulus system. But what is the prevention? Prevention is a permanent training, permanent exercising to avoid such uh, impairments. And for instance, when we talk about swimming, that when you ask a swimmer. Are you uh, uh, are you right or left-handed? The high-class sportsman uh, usually says it doesn't matter for me because if it has uh, if it says I'm uh, right-handed, his uh, right hand works better than the left works. Not so good as us, he might lose. And if both hands are uh, equally effective, it's a uh, it's a good movement with. Uh, with uh, both hands, so he, uh, and he so prevention should be effective. We should teach sportsmen to that, and uh, as a physiologist, as a sportsman, we should properly uh, inform the sportsman. You want to be a winner, you should uh, not. You should use your head along with some uh, your muscles.
uh, I'm sorry for that, uh, so to say, addition. So I would like to say uh, uh, thank you to everyone. I would like to give a photo to Vladimir, to our guest. I, I think you said everything. I think you said everything. So I don't want to touch your others with my poor Russian. No, no, you don't touch anyone. We understand you uh, quite well. So the, a good word, a good word is very good even to the conference participants. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank our, all our guests. I would like to say to thank all the participants. Uh, stay healthy and uh, think about that. You live only once. So would like to wish all success in your works uh, to have great students, great uh, followers to stay always with you and to see you next time at our next Congress. And thank you. Thank you and goodbye.